call this special meeting of the Albany City Council to order. Um, City Clerk, can we please have a roll call? Council Member Hanson Romero. Here. Council Member Jordan. Here. Council Member Lopez. Here. Vice Mayor Mickey. Here. Here. Mayor Tiedemann. Here. Uh, that brings us to our only item for this special meeting, which is our study session on proposed seismic uh, safety soft story retrofits. Um, can we please have staff's report? Thank you. Good evening, council members. Um, my name is Michelle Plaus, community development analyst, and I'm joined tonight by our consultant, David Bonowitz, uh, if you'd like to join us now. David is a structural engineer and an expert on uh, seismic engineering and earthquake safety, and he's helped a number of cities uh, prepare soft story retrofit ordinances like the one we're going to discuss tonight. And he's going to give the first half of our presentation. So I'll call him up to the stand and bring up our PowerPoint. And good evening. Again, my name is David Bonowitz. Uh, happy to be here. Hopefully we'll move quickly and be able to spend as much time as possible on questions. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So a quick reminder of what we're talking about. These are so-called soft story buildings. On the left, you see a collapse from, a near collapse from Loma Prieta. On the right, a collapsed building in Northridge in 1994 in Southern California. Uh, you'll notice the weird acronym that we use in our reports, WFTS, Wood Frame Target Story. That's more, a more technically correct term because the term soft story, even though everybody uses it, and it's okay to use it tonight, and I'll probably use it too, is a more generic term. In fact, if you look at the buildings that are collapsed in Turkey and Syria earthquake, those are also soft story officially buildings, but they're concrete. So that's not what we're talking about here even though the same idea is there, but to make that distinction, we introduced this acronym, which all the Bay Area cities are now using, Wood Frame Target Story. So, next slide. And just a little bit of background. No surprise, we have earthquakes in the Bay Area. We're expecting some again, and we know that they collapse buildings of this type. We saw the two photos on the previous slide. When those buildings collapse, it's not just the loss of the building. Obviously, people are at risk for safety, but they can also cause fires. The Marina Fire and Loma Prieta earthquake was caused by a soft story collapse. They uh, interfere with uh, emergency response, and of course they represent loss of housing as well. So in response to that, cities all over the state have been ena enacting retrofit ordinance, sometimes voluntary, sometimes mandatory, and you see on the screen here a list of the Bay Area programs. San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, and Fremont have mandatory programs for retrofit. And then there's a bunch of others that are in progress right now, and one of those cities is thinking about this, of course, is Albany. Next slide. The buildings look like a variety of different things. The one on the left is most familiar. You know, it's got that characteristic open line with the garage doors, but you can also have not garage doors. The building on the right has a soft story-like condition because it has a crawl space with a, what's called a cripple wall. So equally vulnerable to collapse, Nobody lives in that crawl space, so there's probably loss of, loss of life as a smaller possibility, but that's part of a program that would reasonably think about building collapses to housing. And then there's two more characteristic photos. Next slide. They don't have to be parking spaces. This is housing over commercial. And on the right side, another kind of crawl space, in this case, on a hillside condition. So that empty crawl space on the hill, downhill side, that's also often vulnerable. So, as we're putting the program together, we're including all four of these types. Next slide. The retrofit, it turns out, is pretty simple. Where you have wall, you put plywood on the existing wood, wood studs. That part's easy. If you don't have enough wall, this, the photo on the left, you can create a new wall where there's room for it. Now, where you don't have wall, next slide, where you have the open line with nothing but parking bays, there you might need some steel. So when you have the steel, that gets a little bit more expensive, but that can be done without loss of parking, without loss of access, without loss of window space for a commercial building. And by now, we have cities all over the state that have been doing this and have figured out how to do it, and we have a market of engineers and contractors who know what they're doing. Next slide. Everyone's first question is, what does it cost? 
And of course, you've seen the variety of buildings that are in play here, so the cost is gonna vary quite a bit too. But we know from 2018 work and uh, uh, with data that came out of the early programs in Berkeley and San Francisco, the order of magnitude is $50,000, $100,000, something like that. And of course, it's gonna vary by the size of the building, the complexity of the building, et cetera, and we can come back and talk about that more if you have questions. But obviously, we have a market. The best thing we can do to keep the costs down are two things. Focus the work on the work that really needs to be done, which is just limit yourself to that first story. That's what all these programs do. They don't go above the first story. And create a market that creates efficiencies where you have lots of engineers to choose from, lots of contractors to choose from, and you get that by having a Bay Area with a bunch of mandatory programs so you have a good market there that helps owners. Next slide. So what do we have in Albany? Well, we did this inventory, and this slide has a lot of data, but I think if you just look at the table at the bottom half, you can see the number, and it's in a yellow box there. We think max, we have about 140 buildings that would fall under this category in Albany from the inventory that we did. Now, some of those are larger buildings, some of those are three and four unit buildings, and you can see the breakdown there. So the larger buildings, five units and more, and they don't get very big. I think the biggest one we had was probably like 20 units or something. They are about a third of the buildings, but half of the units. So obviously the bigger buildings have a larger percentage of the total housing units that are at risk from this type of building. But overall, we're talking about a number like 143, and if you think back, next slide, to those four types, this is kind of the breakdown. So about half of those are that kind of classic look, and then there's a, other types are smaller numbers. Now I want to point to one thing, I think it's on the next slide, about the smaller buildings. So we know that one thing that's weird is that the programs that have been doing this work so far are focused on the bigger buildings because they're coming from the bigger cities. Once you get into cities like Albany, and other smaller cities around the Bay Area, you find a lot of three and four unit buildings that have not been considered so far as part of the mandatory program. So here's an example a photo, and that's an Albany building. And we think it's probably not as risky as the others, but we haven't done that study. So that study is now being done. El Cerrito might do a little bit of that study. Uh, FEMA and ATC have done a little bit of analytical work on smaller buildings. I'm hoping to do some smaller building analyses for San Jose as I'm consulting to them now too. They don't have quite this building type, but we may find that this building type is not that much worse than a building that doesn't have a wood frame target story. So in that case, we might find that there's 30 buildings that can be exempted, roughly 30 that might be exempted from the program if we find that out. So the question is, what are our options now as we think about an ordinance? Well, we can go forward with them, keep them in, Right now, Michelle's gonna show you how we, the program lays out over several years with tiers, and these are assigned to the last tier, which means we have plenty of time to do that analysis and find out if these buildings can maybe be exempted. But we can put them in to start with, or we can write into the ordinance an allowance to let the staff, without coming back to council, just say, we're gonna exempt these, or we'll figure out some other way to allow them to be analyzed and shown to be okay, or we can just exempt them now. And say, we had 140 buildings, let's do 110 instead. And you know, so those are, it's an open question and I would feel uh, remiss if I didn't let you know that the smaller buildings in the city are probably not as bad, but we haven't quantified that yet. Next slide, I think is the, the last one. So I turn it back to Michelle and she'll tell you more about uh, the uh, legal aspects of this. Thanks, David. Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more specifically about Albany and the work we've done so far on drafting an ordinance um, for the and mandatory retrofit program. Um, so this has been going on for some time, our work on this. Starting in 2013, the city did a preliminary survey of soft story buildings completed with EERI, the uh, Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, I believe. And then in 2018 and 19, a soft story retrofit program was listed as a strategy in a variety of plans, the local hazard mitigation plan, council strategic plan, general plan, and climate action adaptation plan. Um, and then in February 2019 as well, council discussed and expressed interest in developing a retrofit ordinance. So in 2020, the city hired David Bonowitz, who of course just spoke, uh, to assist in program development. He completed an inventory um, estimating the soft story houses, which was attached with your materials for tonight. 
Um, and then in July of 2021, the council held a study session to discuss that inventory and directed staff to develop an ordinance for a mandatory, mandatory retrofit program, including all buildings with three or more units, um, all soft story buildings, of course. Um, and then since that time, we've been conducting outreach, holding meetings with APRA, the Albany Property Rights Association, and ECHO Housing, um, and have developed an ordinance proposal, which I'll cover tonight. Um, so the basics of the proposed ordinance um, are really in the subject buildings and the process. The subject buildings are these wood frame target story buildings that David was just um, explaining with three or more units built before 1981. And the reason for that is because starting in 1981, the building codes improved significantly and buildings built after that time are much safer. The general process is that first, the city would send out a notification to all of the buildings that might be subject, um, because of course we don't know for sure yet which ones are in fact wood frame target story. Um, so we'd send out to all of the three plus unit buildings before 1981, the notification, and then they would have to go through a screening process to determine whether or not they're subject to the ordinance. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. And then once we have a list of all of the uh, subject buildings, they would have to complete the process of getting a building permit for the retrofit work do the construction, and then submit an affidavit um, showing that the retrof retrofit work is complete. And this is the timeline for that process. So we would be splitting these subject buildings into one of four tiers. Um, and you can see here the, um, the different tiers that we have laid out. And they each have, you know, something around 30 buildings. And this would be to kind of split up the administrative work and also the work for the contractors who would actually be doing this on the ground. Um, and it also provides some more time for the, the slightly more difficult buildings to get their ducks in a row and, and manage this process. Um, in particular, buildings that have a unit in that target story, it's a little bit trickier sometimes. Um, so it gives them some, some extra time to work, at, work all those details out. Um, but as you can see, the timing depends on your tier. Everyone does the screening in the first year and they're placed into a tier. And then the permit, construction, and affidavit happen at different time intervals depending on those tiers. So anywhere between three years and six years from the date, uh, the effective date of the ordinance, we start having buildings complete their retrofits. Um, a little bit more about the screening process. Um, as I said, the screening determines which buildings are wood frame target stories or soft stories and will need retrofits. Um, so we would send out the notification to all of those buildings with three or more units built before 1981 to, t to tell them that they need to be screened. And the basic screening process is that the building owner then hires a licensed architect, architect or engineer to determine whether it's a wood frame target story. They fill out a form that determines which tier they'll be in or if they're exempt. And then the owner submits that to staff for approval. Now, one of the issues that came up in particular when we were talking to APRA about this was that there might be some cases where an engineer isn't always needed um, and we could potentially save on owners some cost and not having everyone need to um, go through this basic process. So we developed some screening enhancements um, to create some, some opportunities uh, to go down different paths. So the first one is that the owner might claim an exemption based on a non-technical condition. For instance, if we got the age of the building wrong in our forms and it turns out it was actually built in 1982 or it actually has two units, um, that wouldn't need an engineer and, and the owner could work that out with the city staff. Uh, number two is for a case where an owner wants to move directly into the program without an engineer. If they're certain that the building is a wood frame target story, they don't need an engineer to tell them that, they can just move right ahead. They still have to complete the form to figure out which tier they're in, but they wouldn't actually have to hire the engineer. And then enhancement three creates an opportunity for city staff to complete the screening. And this is for buildings that are clearly not wood frame target stories. 
Um, so there are three categories that would allow a building to be eligible for this option. If they have full height concrete masonry unit walls, no target story at all, or full height concrete stem walls. Um, if you have questions about those, I'm sure David can explain more. But basically these are conditions that are pretty obvious and make it clear that a building is not a wood frame target story. So in those cases, staff could be able to exempt a building without involving an engineer. And if staff isn't sure, then we can just bring them back to this basic screening process. Um, another kind of special thing we've added into this in particular because of our discussions with Echo Housing, which does the rent review program for the city, um, is some, some ways to avoid tenant displacement during this process. So according to the state law AB 1482, if there's retrofit work on a building or any kind of remodeling work on a building that requires a tenant to temporarily relocate for over 30 days, that is considered just cause for the tenant to be evicted. So in order to prevent potential evictions due to this ordinance, we're uh, planning to include a clause that says specifically that tenants cannot be evicted if they're forced to relocate due to retrofit work. Um, so just make sure that that kind of, um, that process that can happen in, in normal building projects doesn't happen for things specifically due to this ordinance. Um, in that case, the, either the landlord would continue to cr collect rent and then provide temporary housing for the tenant, or the tenant would not be paying rent for the days that they are in a temporary housing um, that they find themselves. And then also we could consider providing some funds from the city to the tenants um, to pay for some of the extra costs that often come from relocation. Um, you know, hotel rooms are generally more than your rent, so the city might consider trying to provide some extra funding for that. Um, the other things that we've included in this is that right now the buildings that have units in the work area are in tiers three and four. Um, these are generally the places where tenants are most likely to de be displaced during the retrofit work, so it gives them some more time to try to plan that out um, and maybe do it when there aren't tenants in those buildings or in those units. And also we've allowed retrofit work to be delayed if it's able to avoid tenant displacement. So for instance, if you have a tenant in a unit where they're going to be displaced for a month and they're gonna move out in four months anyways, we can extend the period for the work to be done until the tenant has moved out or something to that effect. Um, so just always to try to make it the smallest amount of impact on the tenants and also the building owners. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from council? Thank you very much. Are the enhancements or those, I guess, are you asking council for direction on those or are those ones that staff is already building into the ordinance? Not that the ordinance has been written, but. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question in general. Um, I think tonight we're hoping to get any and all feedback from the council on, on these proposals for the way we've designed the ordinance um, and those enhancements included. Um, but that's just sort of, it's what we've written into our, our rough draft as of now. Great, thanks. Um, I'm guessing that also in enhancement one, they might be able to, um, if they've already had the work done, that might be another if they can prove that the yeah absolutely yeah if we had retrofit. if we had proof that they already completed a retrofit um, that might be able to fit into enhancement one or some other exemption yeah one thing we keep in mind there after 1989 a lot of people did voluntary retrofits mm -hmm. some of those probably would not meet the standard that we want to use for the retrofits now so even past work would have to qualify in some way and be reviewed and shown to be roughly equivalent. Maybe there's you know, some exemptions or some, some variances can be allowed if you're you know, doing basically the right thing. And, but it, it not, we wouldn't just accept anything that was done. Yeah, sure, because of course, you know, different guidelines have been done over the years with the, that respect and different brace and bolt type requirements. Well, when we're, and also because when work is done voluntarily, 
yeah. which would be the case until forever, mm -hmm. until there's a mandatory ordinance, it really is not inspected that well. It's not treated the same way by the building department, which is not to say anything wrong with the building, about the building department. It's just it's voluntary work, so there's no standard to check it against. Right? So you end up getting, in many, many cases, pretty well-intentioned retrofit, but it doesn't meet a standard. And are there still uh, programs around the, um, that support the, you know, I, I, there was the California Brace and Bolt, like, program out there for a while to to help with the cost of some of these? Uh, yes, but Brace and Bolt would, would not apply to these buildings. However, interesting that you mentioned it, there is a state program just created last year that sets aside $250 million dollars for soft story retrofits. Now, the details have not been worked out, but the main thing is it's not even funded yet. So it was supposed to be funded based on last year's legislation. Then the budget happened, and their, the governor took it out of his budget. But now the assemblyman who put it in in the first place last year has now brought it back and said, we want to preserve that funding through the budget process. And that just happened last week. Okay. So in fact, I've been in correspondence with Michelle and Jeff that I think that would be a really be beneficial thing to Albany if you're going to have a program to have that state money available to you. So I would, you may want to ask your lobbyist or whoever is working or your contacts in Sacramento to support that bill, which is now Assembly Bill 1505. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, so if I understood correctly, and thank you for the extensive work, um, going through street view and aerial view and everything else you did to get the data set together. If I read it correctly, it seems that the buildings that represent more risk are in the later tiers because they either have residences on the, in the target story or they're on hillsides. Both of those were mentioned as potentially riskier with the first an exception of the first being, I think, N Bay only parking, if I recall reading correctly. So I don't know how many buildings there are that have a residence in the target story that are not N Bay parking only. There's a couple questions in there, I, sorry. I, mean, I, I have that data. Okay. You can look it up. But uh, I think what you're asking is how are the tiers related to the risk? Right. Well, I, I think, yeah. So let me, let me frame this a little better. Um, it seemed to me that the tiers would be inverse from what they are proposed if you're looking purely from a risk basis. So that there's obviously a there's a titration there, you know, which which you're gonna which you're gonna prioritize um, time for those more complicated buildings to get retrofit versus ameliorating the risk earlier. Yeah, if I think you, you put your finger on it. If you were prioritizing by risk, we would try to understand which of these types are more risky. But it turns out that's not what we're trying to do with the tiering and probably not uh, the best strategy anyway. The actual risk from an earthquake between a deadline three years from now and a deadline six years from now is minuscule. Right? And you actually may cause more problems by trying to rush into the early tier a building that has more complications, such as a tenant or an occupied or a commercial space. Those are the buildings that need more time because they're more complicated just to work through the logistics of the, of the project. And that is the purpose for the tiering. It's to spread the work out for the building department, for the building officials, and also to acknowledge that the people who have more complicated projects should be given more time to sort that out. Uh, so that's the basis for the tiering, not trying to make a risk judgment one way or the other. We're treating them all for these purposes as equally risky and saying that the difference between three years and six years is not meaningful. Thank you. Um, so in that regard, I think the hillside buildings were characterized as being more complicated, or it seems like they could be more complicated. Um, the tiering doesn't differentiate based on whether a building's on a hillside or not. Uh, so I don't know if that would be, well, I'd be curious to hear the thinking around that. Uh, well, the thinking around that originally was that's a small number of buildings in Albany and the engineers know how to deal with it and we'll deal with it at the time, but it's not the bulk of the program. Now, since then, I've done some work for Mill Valley, which is all hillside. 
Uh, not all of it, but there's a, a substantial number. So that is a question we can write in and get you know some of the ideas that we're developing there about making sure the engineer is looking for uh, maybe there's a map of mapped landslides and maybe they should be given special treatment. If not deemed more risky, they just ought to get a different kind of attention when they go through the retrofit process. Thank you. And then I have a related question about different structures after we're done talking about wood frame in the question period. I, yeah, I'd rather finish the wood frame discussion before going there. Any questions from over here? Um, so I noticed in some of your slides you showed examples of retail on the ground floor and residential units above. I just want to clarify, when you say three or more units, is that three or more units period as in only residential, or is it if you have two units of residential and a commercial unit below, that's considered three units? We, the way we've written it now and the way other cities have dealt with this question is residential only okay. because it's focused on housing. Okay. So in Albany, we have some storefronts that might only have two units above. They would... They do not apply, it does not. We, every program like this, you gotta draw some lines, right. and that is where we draw a line. You don't have to draw the line there, but that's, that's where we've drawn it tentatively. Right. Okay, now I'll ask. Um, so, I think I asked this question a couple of years ago when we met, uh, which I thank you and staff for having us meet at that time, shortly I came after, uh, shortly after I came into office, um, but it's, it's obviously been highlighted by the unfortunate reality in Turkey, southern Turkey and Syria. Um, and so I was remotivated to look at that question. I found a report from UC Berkeley's Seismic Research Center, a peer report. Um, actually, I think it was a, a master's thesis, but nonetheless, it had a table in there of voluntary identification or estimation of non ductile concrete buildings in various cities in the Central Bay. Um, and somebody from Albany, I don't know who, volunteered that we have 36 non ductile concrete buildings as an estimate. Um, so I'm most concerned about Gayview. Uh, my understanding is the non ductile concrete buildings are similar. If they went through plan check and engineering before, say, 1980, they could potentially be non ductile concrete. Um, if Gayview should be in that category, uh, that's a lot of residences, a lot of people. Um, more risks probably than we're talking about with all these other buildings tonight, potentially. I'm not sure I would go there yet. Uh, did you say is Bayview? Was that the name of the complex? Uh, Gateview. Gateview. Yeah, it's got almost 500 residences in it and like four or five towers. Uh, is this the one on the other side of the hill? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So speaking not about Gateview specifically, even though I've raised it, but about non-ductile concrete in general, do you have any sense? of Albany's risk with regard to non ductile concrete? Albany's, no. I would have to review that, that work that was done. I'm familiar with the project overall from the Concrete Coalition. I was involved in it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, it was not done to be as specific to any city. It was done to get kind of a general context statewide. I think they probably looked at Sanborn maps as a mm -hmm. way of figuring that out, and mm -hmm. I don't, I, we, we want to review that. Um, but Certainly, uh, you know, as a structural engineer, I'm not going to dissuade Albany from looking at any building and the <laughs> seismic risk that it poses. So if we want to do that, we can do it. Now, I wouldn't do it as part of the same program. Different kind of building, different kind of engineering, different scale of, of cost. Everything is so different. Mm -hmm. What makes these programs efficient is that you're dealing with basically the same thing over and over again. So to bring in a completely different idea or a different animal, we would do that separately. Mm -hmm. but Certainly, it's, it's worth doing. Now, other cities have been thinking about concrete buildings. Um, only a few have, only mo all in Southern California have mandatory programs about those. But again, they, it's because they have enough buildings that it rises to the level of being a citywide issue. Mm -hmm. So here, there would be a legitimate question, why, is the, uh, why does one building or one complex justify a public policy intervention citywide? I don't, you know, that's a fair mm -hmm. question. And that's why, as you suggest, you'd want to look at the, all the buildings and mm -hmm. see what is the inventory and what do they represent. Of those 36 buildings are, how many of them are one-story buildings? Mm -hmm. you know? We just don't know that. Uh, and I guess I would also caution while we're talking about this, not all concrete buildings are the same. 
and very few U.S. concrete buildings are anything like what we're seeing in Turkey. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, seeing none, thank you. Um, I believe that brings us to public comment. I am Peter Campbell. Is this on? Yeah. Um, you know I have to make a comment. Uh, the um, two things. One, did you say that the concrete s uh, stem wall would be exempt? The, the thinking is, so a concrete stem wall is the wall around the unoccupied crawl space. If the full, if the full crawl space height is concrete, then there's no wood frame target story. Okay, because I, I kind of um, think those should be included as well. You know, you look at the earthquake in Turkey. I, I was in Turkey in 2001, and <clears throat> we were on a boat most of the time, but for one night we were in a hotel. The hotel was a concrete construction, well, it was a concrete frame with hollow tiles in between. It was quite a weird construction. You could hear everything happening down the other end of the hall through the walls. But um, you look at the earthquake and, and you see the video of the buildings that collapsed, and I'm sure that they weren't built to code. They were probably paid for code. But um, I think they were concrete buildings and not properly reinforced. And I think you need to look at those and make sure that they are properly reinforced because concrete is pretty hard, but it breaks when it gets flexed. So I think that's important to look at. <clears throat> and I'm running out of time here, but I also wanted to sec second Mr. Jordan's comments on gate view. I don't know if any of you were around when those were built. There was a bit of controversy about them at the time. And I was here and I watched them as they were building them. And I did not see much steel going into those buildings. A little bit of rebar, but that was about it, that I, as far as I could tell. Now, I wasn't up close, but I'm really concerned about those buildings. And in a major quake, six and a half, seven, seven and a half, I'm afraid it's gonna come down. And I would really like the city to thoroughly evaluate and investigate that building and do whatever is necessary to make sure that it's as safe as possible, because I just don't think it is. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Hello. My name is Chris Moore. I'm with uh, East Bay Rental Housing Association, uh, and I own uh, some properties in the Oakland program, and I just wanted to give some comments on their seismic program, just some, some feedback. Um, and, and actually, I, was, I went to undergrad at Cal State Hayward and was fortunate enough 25, 30 years ago to take a geological uh, uh, class, and we learned all about uh, the Hayward Fault. And it's not, you know, if it's going to happen, it's, you know, when will it happen. Uh, it's overdue, actually. So super important program. Um, I think just some what I saw and some good things about Oakland's program and, and some uh, areas that could have been improved. One is... Because I took that earthquake program, I voluntarily did my building ahead of time. Um, and so they had a program where I could submit my uh, engineering work. I hired a seismic engineer to do, to do the design. I submitted that. And uh, they reviewed it right at the beginning of the program. And they said, hey, you qualify. It sounds like your screening program would probably do that same process. But that was a nice uh, thing that I had already done all the work and, and they approved it and said, hey, you're, you're not required. Um, I also, uh, I have another building that I'm, I'm, I currently have a, an estimate on and I think if you could have some type, there's a lot of unscrupulous, um, there, there, I shouldn't say a lot, there are some unscrupulous uh, contractor engineers out there and there's a lot of people that that are in the community that are not going to really know what this kind of costs. I've had an estimate for one building from $25,000 to $150,000, right? So they, this guy wanted to put in a huge uh, moment frame and all this work when I just need to take one garage, which I'm willing to give up, 
and and do some some uh, structural work there. So I, if you had a forum on next door or something like that, just so you have the the, the feedback to the community, so they're not spending. Um, hey, uh, so oh, and permits. So you you're setting up tiers. It's important to to allocate that work. Uh, you know, as you mentioned. In Oakland, my building right now, I submitted the permit eight months ago. Technically, my deadline is February 21st, might even be today. It's still out there, I don't know. You know, they haven't approved the permit, even though the deadline's today. So just be aware, don't penalize people if the building department can't get the work done. A um, Couple other things, uh, if you could facilitate getting funding or grants, I, that was mentioned earlier, Super helpful. A lot of times, this, the funding in the past has not applied to multifamily properties. It's just for individual single-family homes. And the last thing, if you're if if you're going to be you're talking later tonight about just cause and these other things, exclude the seismic program from this. Uh, I know somebody who their their uh, tenant is in a building right now, and they want to they want the eight thousand dollar fees in Oakland for being moved out for two weeks, right? So. Um, and so you just, just have to um, make sure that those policies, if you uh, implement them over the years, don't impact that. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay, that no brings, us, brings us back to council consideration. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts? Sure. Sure, getting used to the new push on, push off. Um, well, I'm very excited to be at this point. Uh, you know, when Albany put together its hazard plan, it didn't include mitigation or uh, mandatory retrofit back in 2018. Um, I brought it up and it got included after the draft. And it's been the last two strategic plans. So as we think about strategic plan next March, uh, this March in a few days, um, keep in mind items that go in the strategic plan can take quite a while to to actually come around due to staff capacity. Uh, so that's a theme I'll, I'll bring back, um, which is no fault of staff. My theme, as I said two years ago, is I think council doesn't do its job in terms of narrowing, narrowing the list. Um, so other than that, um, uh, delayed retrofit to avoid tenant displacement, that was a question. Did staff have a, a thought on how long that delay, what would be the maximum delay allowed, or are you looking for direction on that? Well, um, we, we don't have any like specific <clears throat> amount written into it. I think that would probably be something that would come to, down to a conversation between the building owner and the building official. Um, but we could put in some specific uh, maximum if the council wanted to. Yeah, I'd be in favor of having it hardwired in so that the building official isn't put in that, that situation. Uh, that doesn't really seem exactly fair. Um, for staff, so I think I'll put a year on the table. Other people can have other other thoughts on that. Um, you had uh, enhancements, and I have notes here, but I what my vote would be, but I don't actually remember what the enhancements are. Well, I think enhancement one was. Well, you tell me. Enhancement one. Yes, uh, I can bring it up. Sure, here thanks. If that's Sorry about that. Um, but enhancement one was basically. If they were, if the building owner is claiming an exemption that isn't for a engineering reason, right? But for instance, if they actually only have two units in the building or something to okay. that effect. So that seems eminently reasonable. Deal with reality. Um, and enhancement two. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I got you off guard. Okay. There we go. Um, so yes, enhancement two is if the owner knows that their building is a soft story building, they want to move directly into the program without seeing an engineer. Okay, that'd be great. Um, on enhancement three, so if city staff completes the screening, that seems like more of a burden on city staff, um, unless there's a fee for that service, which I don't know if that's the thought or not, but if there's no fee for that service, I'm, I'm not as enthused. Um, by it, and I mean, in general, I would have a preference for a professional structural engineer to do that work. So I, I don't know if staff has, has any more thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it definitely would be an added burden and cost on staff. The intent was to try to shift some of the cost away from the building owners 
um, and onto the city slightly and hopefully to do it in a way where staff would be able to complete these screenings very efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be a lower cost overall. Um, and the idea is that, you know, people would have to send in some forms and photos and things to, to show that it's clearly one of these conditions and then staff can check that quickly, go out to the building and just confirm. Mm -hmm. um, so the hope would be that we'd be able to structure something that doesn't require very much staff time and is able to save costs for the building owners. Um, but that said, it definitely would be additional work for staff. Um, Jeff? Yes, I'm a little bit disinclined to that. Um, and I also think having a professional structural engineer's report on those building types would help to better inform the city in terms of emergency response and what might go on with those buildings in a, in a large earthquake. Uh, so that's my thought for the moment. Could change, but that's my thought for the moment. Cool. Uh, any other comments from council? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask another question then. <laughs> Please do. Um, <laughs> this is your bailiwick. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you mentioned, obviously, there's efficiency if the Bay Area manages to keep the, the market going for um, contractors that specialize in this work to, to keep rolling along and doing it. Um, brought to mind the, the obvious question, but you, you sort of intimated to it by the other cities you're working with. So are there any other cities that are have an ordinance that they're on the verge of adopting that are at the stage we're at that aren't thinking, you know, where, where are other cities at in terms of keeping the market going in competition? Well, Oakland is still in the middle of their program. Okay. And that's one of the larger programs, a thousand buildings. I'm not sure how many they have left, but that's the bulk of it right now. San Francisco is really winding down and, and finished and Berkeley is essentially done. Um, I mentioned Mill Valley, they're even smaller than Albany. Right? Uh, uh, El Cerrito has been looking at this topic, but has not gone in the direction of ordinance. They've just gone in, in the direction of inventory and fact-finding so far because that was the nature of the grant that they got. Uh, the big one on the horizon is San Jose. So San Jose is going to be another thousand buildings or so. And again, I'm just to be clear, I'm not saying anything that isn't already publicly known. Um, and you know, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we're in the development process now. And the thought is that that will go to their council sometime this year. Okay. Do you, looking at all of this, do you have any suggestions on what would be the best timing for Albany? I mean, I can see there'd be some, potentially some benefit if we can put ourselves in a place where we're in kind of in between Oakland winding down and San Jose winding up so the contractors are hungry and, you know, willing willing to maybe get a better, give a better price for little Albany. Well, from that perspective, the answer is always, uh, you know, the sooner the better, I guess. But, you know, nobody knew what was coming with the pandemic. Nobody knew what was coming with supply chains. Nobody knew what was coming with inflation or recession or whatever. And that really is the big wild card, that a lot of these programs, and I support all of them, and they, they all deserve to go forward, even in marginal economic times, mm -hmm. because the alternative is worse. But it is true that when a lot of these bigger programs statewide got started, we were in the middle of a boom cycle and property values were going up and, you know, it was just, it didn't hurt anybody to do it. And if we had come a year ago or, you know, early 2020 before the pandemic hit and tried to run this through then, it just would not have happened because the political will has to be there. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of more on you guys than it is on on uh, uh, my recommendations, but it's a matter of getting a sense of what the owners are willing and ready to do and what value they see in the project. Thank you. I'm just gonna, I understand the time, and obviously it's very important, but with um, that AB 1505 that you were talking about, I'd like to see if there was a way to time it out to where we could take advantage of that, should that, but again, I don't know the timeline on that. And then also, as far as you know, having a structural engineer come in and do the inspection, do all that, I don't think that that's really necessary in a lot of these cases, if I'm correct. Is that the... Are you referring to the screening phase? Um, well, what you were mentioning about 
preferring a structural engineer come in and do do that. It's a lot of the times the people who are doing the work already know what needs to be done. Yeah, there really is not built into the program a lot of investigation and evaluation. Yeah. Unless unless the engineer comes in and says this building's already pretty good, we don't have to do any retrofit. Then you're going to have to show by calculation that you already comply. But we intentionally are getting away from that old way of thinking that do an evaluation first and then do the. There's no reason for that. Just go, we, we know what we're looking at. We'll do the retrofit. If the retrofit calculations show the building's already okay, you're done anyway. Mm -hmm. So why waste time with that? So really the timing issue is about making sure that the owners have enough time to get their own act together, to get their financing together, to coordinate with their tenants. A lot of these are not sophisticated developers. So to make sure that they feel comfortable, as some of the comments were saying, about that they've got the right engineer, that they can consult with Yelp, and with their colleagues and maybe with the Rental Housing Association, get good references, and just let them have enough time to feel comfortable with the program. That's as important a part of the success of the program as you know, getting in and doing it quickly. So I, I, that's, as far as the timing on the, the state program, nobody knows the timing on that. <laughs> if this bill gets done, what it means is that the state will now have money to start developing the program, which means they're still six months away at least from putting out the first call for applicants. And there's a lot of wording in the base bill about what this program is. It's still undefined. And we, we don't know how they're going to answer those questions, but the crucial first step is get the program funded so that the people in Sacramento who have, are charged with developing the program can actually spend time on it. Right now, they're not even allowed to work on it, even though the thing was approved last year. Thank you. Can I say a word about the enhancement three? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think that might, because I am, think I'm detecting different perspectives. So setting aside buildings that might come under enhancement three, does the screening phase for other buildings, is it intended to involve a structural engineer or not? Screening always involves a structural engineer if you're making a, an engineering determination. So that's why enhancement one was an innovation that came out of Hayward that said, we're bringing an engineer out here to tell us how many units are in the building. We don't need that. Mm -hmm. If you're making it, because part of the screening is not just to assign the tier, but that's also where you apply your exemptions. That if your building is supposed to be exempt, that's when you figure it out during the screening. So if you're going to claim, I don't really have a wood frame target story, we need an engineer to say that. So that enhancement three, first of all, it's a, something that could never be done in a larger city. It's a good option possibly for Albany, and that came from our meetings with the Rental Housing Association that said, I'm not even supposed to be in the program. I know it, you know it, but now I have to go hire an engineer to tell you that. So in a smaller community that has a much more personal relationship with your owners, that it looked like there was a way to try, maybe we can find a way to get, provide that service if you can show us the photos. And you can see them just, I've, on my way here, just walking down Canes, and you can see enough in the building that that building is block wall. It is not wood, right? So if they can take those photos, send them to Michelle, we can figure that out and they can save that expense. And it's again, it's the intention is for people who aren't supposed to be in the program. Okay, that changes my vote. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't, I didn't understand that aspect. But, but, yeah. it was a, but it was a very important question because we've yeah. been having the same conversation. What happens if all of a sudden all 150 owners call up and request the city to do this? Well, we can't have that. Right. So it's, if we find the right way to get the balance where they can say, if you can show us that you really weren't supposed to be in the program and it looks pretty clear, right. we'll help you out. Yeah, I'd like to send us some photos and then, then we'll show up. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not seeing any other comments from council. Um, staff, are there any decision points we haven't hit on that you would like more direction on? Assuming that lack of commentary means that we like what you've brought us and <laughs> are happy to go with the recommendation? Um, yeah, I think I think our next question is uh, whether the council is ready for us to bring an ordinance to review and um, you know work towards enacting, or if there are still things you want to have another study session on or consider, um, you know, look into. I'm personally happy to have them move forward. Everyone's thoughts? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a yes. Um, so, yes, thank you. Great. Thank you. And I will add, and I don't know, maybe this has to be in the strategic plan. I don't know 
what the way to approach it is, but I am interested in these non-ductile concrete building um, review, how many there are, if there are any. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, that brings us to our adjournment of the special meeting. We will reconvene for our regular meeting at 7. Um, thank you all.
Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Evening all, we're going to call this meeting of, or this regular meeting of the Albany City Council to order. Uh, and we will start with our land acknowledgement uh, read by Councilmember Jordan. The City of Albany recognizes that we occupy the land originally protected by the Confederated Villages of Lashon. We acknowledge the genocide that took place on these lands and must make strides to repay the moral debt that is owed to this indigenous people, specifically the Ohlone tribe. We thank them for their contributions, which have transformed our community and will continue to bring forth growth and unity. The City of Albany commits to sustaining ongoing relationships with the tribe and together build a better future for all that now make this their home. Thank you. Um, before we do roll call, uh, I have a brief mayor statement, which echoes what I put out in writing earlier this week. Um, I just wanted to mention that as many in our community have heard, we have seen a, a recent spat of burglaries and vandalism on Solano this past month. Thankfully, our staff in both the police department and across the city have responded quickly, uh, increasing the patrols, which the police chief tells me they do whenever there is a need, and working with affected businesses. Especially helpful has been a repurposing of money we allocated for business support grants under ARPA to help those hit with large costs of unanticipated window replacement. Um, unfortunately, we cannot stop all crime like this, especially vandalism for its own sake, but I want to assure everyone that we are being proactive and coordinating uh, a quick and high quality response, and we'll have more information included as part of the city manager's report. Um, with that, can we go to roll call? Councilmember Hanson Romero. Here. Councilmember Jordan. Here. Councilmember Lopez. Here. Vice Mayor Mickey. Here. And Mayor Tiedemann. Here. Uh, that brings us to the city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor. As mentioned now by the mayor, our business community has unfortunately experienced incidents of vandalism and burglaries over the last several months. This includes 25 incidents since January 1st of this year, six on San Pablo, 19 on Solano Avenue. Of that, 13 were vandalism cases, 11 were burglaries. The largest numbers occurred on the evening of February 10th and the early morning hours of February 14th. We regret these incidents have occurred and are working collaboratively across several city departments to respond to the needs of our businesses. Our immediate steps include extra patrols by the police department, community notifications regarding the incidents, direct outreach to businesses that have experienced the incidents, and grant funding to support these businesses. In terms of extra patrols, we have done and continue to do security checks, foot patrols, area checks, park and walks. And our police department has increased patrols along Solano, including uh, between January 1st and today, 187 extra patrols on Solano. In fact, the department was conducting a supplemental patrol in the area just a few minutes after the incidents occurred on February 14th, demonstrating how quickly this type of incident can occur and that timing can be very critical in thwarting crime. Extra patrols are also conducted in other commercial areas, not just Solano, uh, Sol San Pablo Avenue, East Shore, Cleveland Avenue, and other areas around the city. The police department has also worked to further adjust response and presence, added additional staffing as available, and employed alternative deterrent methods. We're monitoring these to see how effective they are and adapting as needed. As the mayor stated, we can't necessarily prevent crime, but we can respond as best as possible. We're also investigating these cases and following up on some evidence that has been collected from the scenes. 
In terms of outreach, this is also an ongoing effort across departments. Um, the, the next event that we will be holding is a uh, partner event with City of Berkeley as well as the Solano Avenue Association um, this Thursday to speak directly to businesses on Solano Avenue. We will be holding another Coffee with the Cops event shortly thereafter as well. Uh, the police department is also available for appointment-based uh, scheduling so that our staff can come out to businesses as needed to talk through safety and any other concerns. Community notifications are sent out regularly, which can be found on our website and can be subscribed to via email. We distribute a business e-news and over, have over a thousand subscribers to this e-news. We also work through Solano Avenue Association and the Chamber of Commerce to help forward the information on an ongoing basis. As also mentioned by the mayor, we quickly established a grant program over the last week, uh, which now includes both window and door repairs for those that have experienced vandalism or burglaries. Our staff are reaching out directly to the businesses impacted. However, any business that has an inquiry can also contact us at econdev, E-C-O-N-D-E-V, at albanyca.org, or by phone to 510-528-5736 to learn more about this program. <clears throat> We're also looking into other opportunities for grant programs involving safety. Um, we have had a security camera registration program as well since um, January of 2020. 56 businesses have signed up for this program and we encourage those with security cameras to join us in this partnership to help solve crimes by going to our website to sign up and learn more, albanyca.org slash camera reg, R-E-G. And I'm happy to take any questions. I know that was a lot of information. Um, other news? Uh, the power is out at our community center, which is the house of our KLB channel 33. So if folks are trying to tune in through cable television, uh, we recommend you view via YouTube or join by Zoom for this meeting. The Albany Summer Recreation Catalog should be hitting doors any day. It's also available, this is mailed citywide, including um, zip codes that are outside of 94706. Thank you for uh, letting us know about that part of our community. Um, and this houses all of the upcoming summer recreation opportunities within the city between May and August. We have financial assistance available for Friendship Camp participants. The city is offering financial subsidies to Friendship Camp participants. The subsidies are available to campers and junior counselors who reside in Albany. You should apply before registering for the camp. For more information, contact Kate Miller, our specialist at kmiller at albanyca.org or call 510-559-7227. And our city clerk is displaying these as I mention them. The Albany Fire Department provided disaster preparedness training to the school district staff members at Cornell Elementary February 15th. The training was modified from our disaster preparedness program and included the use of fire extinguishers, removing victims from a collapse building, and first aid training. The department hopes to continue this training for the other school district sites. And another um, promo for our, our advisory bodies. We still have some vacancies open on advisory bodies. Please check our website or come to any of our public counters to get more information on the opportunities that remain available to engage directly in your community. That conclu concludes my report. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, especially for preparing some of that information last minute. Um, are there any questions from council? Uh, if anyone attending would like to ask a question about or comment on the city manager's report, please raise your hand uh, or submit something to the city clerk. You will have one minute. If you're on the phone, please press your hand, uh, raise your hand by pressing star nine. Note this is for questions and comments on the city manager's report only. If you have comments on matters not on the agenda, the time for those is next. In this and all comments and questions during the meeting, please address the council, not other attendees, and respect each other. Uh, the council wants everyone to feel comfortable speaking and not be intimidated by others' comments or reactions. Uh, good evening, my name is Jeremiah Garrett Buello. Um, I have two questions for the city manager. Uh, you mentioned the, the ARPA funds uh, for the burglaries and vandalism that's been occurring in our business community. I was wondering um, how much money is still in the ARPA funds? Is it 50,000, 100,000, a million? What, what's our, um, <clears throat> is in there? And then also, you mentioned the fire department at Cornell School doing disaster preparedness. I was wondering if, uh, if you guys are going to include the CERT people or the CERT organizers. I know you mentioned there's school districts, um, other schools gonna be in the future. So maybe you can incorporate uh, CERT, that way uh, students and teachers can get more familiar with the CERT program. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hi, uh, my name is Tenor Shen, and uh, I, I wanna make a comment about the burglaries. I'm glad that the city extended the grant opportunities to fix the windows, and uh, that I'm, I appreciate that the police department increased the patrols. Uh, perhaps uh, another grant option can be given to businesses who will like to implement a video system as long as they also sign up with uh, the police department so that the video will be available through them, uh, for them, for free, and then the police will have access to more video cameras uh, to prevent crime. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is Francesco Papalia. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to get down there today. I, I'm feeling kind of sick, so I wish I could be there in person for this and for the housing element uh, issue. Uh, but regarding this uh, program for the, um, for the damage that was done, I know that there were at least two of the businesses that had videos uh, that capt probably captured the, the person who did it or persons. And I know that there's a uh, video camera outside of uh, five tacos that would have captured them. Um, is is the, uh, are the police ready to uh, uh, do anything and arrest anybody? Or do they have a subject or a clear subject in mind about who the perpetrator or perpetrators were? Thank you. And can we get updates about this? Thank you. That's, that's all. Thank you. Um, I'll refer <laughs> some of those questions to the city manager. I wrote them down or you may have captured them. Thank you, Mayor. I'm not sure I fully heard the first question uh, from Mr. Panguillo, but- uh, How much is in our ARPA funds still? Uh, remaining, I don't have that off the top of my head. I can say that for the business programs, um, that was directed by the council in October of last year and funding is still remaining uh, for both of these programs which we've been able to transition to. Uh, as part of your next budget update, we will ensure a full accounting of expenditures to date of the ARPA funds. Um, with regard to the camera system, yes, that is something that staff is currently looking into in terms of the feasibility of establishing such a grant program and, and what the uh, components of that would look like. Um, agreed that cameras certainly can be incredibly helpful in uh, solving crimes. And as uh, stated by uh, Mr. Papalia, yes, we, uh, I believe as I stated, 
we do have some footage that has helped in um, furthering the investigation of some of these incidents and we'll continue to follow up on any leads we have. We would encourage our business community to um, coordinate and communicate with our police department whenever they may have um, anything that may feel, even the tiny little bit of information can be incredibly helpful in confirming an overall situation. Uh, so we will continue to engage directly to ideally find the individuals responsible for the damages. Thank you. Um, and I believe there was one other question of if the fire department's school trainings include CERT at all? Yes, it's based on um, the CERT curriculum and uh, training. Uh, however, the actual training is conducted by our staff. Great, thank you. Uh, that brings us to good, uh, to good of the city. This is for attendees to provide the council comments, information, and questions on an item that is not on the agenda. Please raise your hands now or by phone press star nine. By state law known as the Brown Act, the council cannot discuss items that are not on the agenda except under extraordinary circumstances. Right, rather, items raised may be referred to a future agenda or staff to comment. Uh, good evening, my name is Margie Marks. I have some great news to report. Albany Thrives Together runs the free shower program at the high school. I want to report out that one of our long-term clients, and I'm speaking of someone more than five or six years, is a man named Ray Jacobs, who gave me permission to use his name. He's in his 70s. He lives in a tent in Albany. He has no teeth, and he's very hard of hearing. We got Ray hooked up with Carol from Albany Cares. In a couple weeks, he will come for his shower, and then one of us will drive him to a health care clinic in Berkeley where he will get a full medical workup to determine his immediate and long-term needs. This is the first step to getting him housed, which CARES is working on for him. Someone asked me if I knew the status of Mama Bear, who was a client and long-term homeless woman who lived at the Albany Bulb and would sometimes come and talk to the council. I am happy to report that with a lot of prodding from Jim and Elspeth Beller, Mama Bear has been permanently placed in a home for at least three years now. She lives in a two-bedroom apartment in Albany with the other bedroom going to her full-time live-in caregiver. We have had one client who, for mental health reasons, has not been able to be placed in permanent housing. But for those clients who are able, which it turns out is most, Albany Cares has helped to move them into permanent housing. And the most important part, they have stayed housed in the same place for years now. So I really want to thank the city and Albany Cares for all the work they've done to provide housing for homeless in Albany. It, it really has made a difference and people have stayed housed. Thank you. Thank you for your comment and the good news. <clears throat> Peter Campbell again. Um, I don't know if the city can do anything about this, but I've been concerned for years about the um, uh, filthy sidewalks and trash accumulation and graffiti around the CVS <coughs> uh, store on Solano at, at Ramona. And I, I know that existence of graffiti invites more graffiti, and I just wonder if there's a way that the city can somehow put pressure on that particular business and other businesses that may have a similar problem. Uh, to, to clean up the graffiti and clean up their sidewalks. It's really unsightly. It does not reflect well on the city. Uh, the CVS, you know, has a parking lot with some concrete walls on it, and there's a, a, quite a bit of tagging on those walls, and it's going to invite more. So I just hope that the city can do something about that in that location and in other locations as well. Thank you. Thank you. Evan Epstein and Lauren Russell. <clears throat> Good evening, Angie Devine, uh, former graduate of Albany Middle School when it used to be down here where I met my wife, also graduated from Albany High School, have the good fortune of having my two-year-old daughter attend a daycare uh, right at Memorial Park in the old Veterans Building. Um, unfortunately, we received some distressing news recently that um, the school <coughs> is owned by a private equity firm and they're increasing tuition from 50 to 60 percent 
And me, I'm a union carpenter. I commute to the city every day. It's very great to get off at El Cerrito Plaza Bart, go and pick up my daughter, and be able to walk two blocks to our home on Spokane. Um, now they're making it where it's not feasible at that price increase. And I know, correct me if I'm wrong, This uh, they sprung this on us on Valentine's Day, or I think it was the 13th of February. So it's all new to me. I haven't been able to do all the research, but I believe uh, the city of Albany owns that property and they're renting it from you. And I'm pretty sure you guys aren't increasing the rent by that exponential amount. Um, I, I would love to keep my daughter there. I pick her up today. We play at the playground right there and we walk home. Um, but 50 to 60 percent is not feasible for us. We're working family. My wife is a, a dental hygienist. As I said, I'm a union carpenter. So I just want to know if you guys are aware of the tenant and their financial status and what they're doing. And it seems like they're taking all that money and they're not even putting it towards the staff at that location. And obviously, I'm assuming they're not paying an increased rent by you people here. Um, they're using it for something else, and it doesn't seem right. It's, and I just want to see if you guys can help us out here, because there's a lot of parents here that have children there. We enjoy going to that school, and we don't want to see an end to that. But right now, it seems like they're, they're pressing us, and it's, it, it's not feasible for a lot of families. So I appreciate uh, any help you can provide us. Thank you for your comment. Hi, my name is Lauren Russell, and I would also like to talk about the same issue and bring light to the predatory practices and consumer protection concerns raised by the Kids Speaking Spanish KSS Immersion School, owned by private equity firm Crane Street Capital, where my three and a half year old attends preschool. Our ask to the city is to send a letter to KSS express expressing its displeasure with the recent tuition increase and abusive practices it's engaging in, and also to meet with KSS management to advocate for a year-long delay in the tuition hike on behalf of constituent families and to ensure that predatory consumer practices like this don't occur in the city of Albany or elsewhere. So here's a little background. KSS operates five schools in the East and South Bay, in Albany, Walnut Creek, two in Oakland, one in San Jose. Approximately 200 to 250 families send their preschool students to KSS schools, and about 40 of these families attend the Albany location, which uses city-owned space at Memorial Park for its preschool facilities. KSS announced a 50% to 60% tuition hike for families, a roughly $800 increase per month on February 13th. Additionally, KSS is adding a 3% financing fee for families that pay monthly rather than lump sum. So this is about, on average, $25,000 to $27,000 a year. I don't have that kind of money. And we are penalized uh, for not being able to pay that upfront. Um, as part of the announcement, KSS also notified parents that they were reducing the school year from 12 months to 10 months. Um, and parents will have to pay in addition on top of that $27,000 for those two extra months. The school is offering a financial aid program, but it lacks all transparency and accountability. Applying requires submitting tremendous amounts of personal financial details to a third party that uses proprietary processes to estimate the maximum amount they think families can afford to pay, and then they share this with the school. And it costs about $60 to apply for this financial aid, though that fee was waived on Friday uh, after some parents pushed back. Notably, as my colleague mentioned, the dramatic rate hike will not trickle down to staff uh, or lead to any change at most KSS locations. No new teachers, no new curriculum, materials, or any tangible offerings. Instead, it will be used to fund a new K-5 venture in Oakland. So the actions by KSS and Crane Street Capital underscore the predatory practices of this pervasive industry. There's nothing unusual about child care centers operating as for-profit businesses, but while the typical community-based center generates very narrow profit margins, chain centers like this, backed by private equity, um, expect 15 to 20 percent of revenue, according to the New York Times, and engage in these kinds of abu abusive practices to sustain them. So as landlord, we hope that the city of Albany will uh, send this official letter to KSS and uh, meet with management to advocate for a year-long delay in tuition increase on behalf of constituents in the city. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Absolutely, yeah. 
Hi, my name is Evan Epstein, and I'm uh, a lawyer. I'm a professor at UC Hastings, and I live in Albany, and I have my son in the same school, three years old, at KSS. I think what we want is for the city of Albany to send a letter to KSS and to Crane Street Capital expressing its displeasure with this hardball tactics that are forcing us as parents to pay this new tuition increase. It's not that we are against the increase per se, but it's the way that they did it. They did it two days before pre-enrollment, so all the parents are forced to pay this tuition increase. And that, I think, is the problem. Uh, more importantly, uh, to solve this, I think they have to delay this decision at least for a year to give the parents the option to opt in or out of this tuition. That's the fair thing to do. That's the right thing to do. And it's, not, it's unfair that we are put into this position. Um, just to give you some context, they emailed us on February 13th at 6 p.m., uh, three days before enrollment, and as recently as February 10th, no parent knew about this increase. In fact, they were still told that the price was going to be the same, some in writing. So this creates some consumer protection issues, potentially unfair business practice, unfair competition, and false advertising. Parents were giving no prior communication about these changes, and they were given no opportunity for feedback. So you can imagine how parents feel at this point we have no alternatives. It's very hard to find other places that are still open uh, for our kids. Uh, there are waiting lists. And uh, Spanish immersion is one of the most difficult places. And people care a lot about Spanish immersion. And this is one of the schools. So uh, more, moreover, what they are doing now is they're rejecting possibility to meet collectively. They're, they only want to meet one-on-one, -on -one, and this is making it very hard for parents to push back to do anything about it. So maybe the city of uh, Albany could maybe mediate or be an intermediary between the parents, 40 families in Albany, and the school. In conclusion, as landlords as well, we hope that the city of Albany will send an official letter by the city to KSS and Crane Street Capital, which is the big investor behind this, expressing displeasure, and also to meet with KSS management or Crane Street Capital to advocate at least for one year uh, pushback so that we as parents can opt in or out of this tuition increase. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. And thanks for the opportunity to share. Um, the co-parents here have done a really good job of outlining the problem that we are experiencing with Crane Street and the KSS administration. Um, I'd just like to share a couple of things. One is that um, you know the day-to-day -day operations, the teachers, the care that our children receive are top-notch. My son has been there since November of last year and has experienced wonderful growth and settled in. And it's a very challenging transition, as all parents are aware, when you change schools. Um, so if we're forced to remove my son and find another spot for him, it will be his third school in three years, which is asking a lot of anybody, especially, you know, a toddler. And I think another thing to um, underscore as well is these are emails that are very long and verbose and not easily understood. So it takes real concentration at the end of a day of working and taking care of your children to even make sense of what they're asking or presenting to us in short notice, unreasonably, as we've underscored. So I just wanted to share how we felt um, that this has been really poorly handled by KSS um, decision makers or Crane Street or whoever is passing this down. And it's also resulted in their um, further communications to clarify. And I think it's really indicative of a problem with these policies if it requires further explanation and further emails. And um, you know, none of us really have any great clarity. Uh, the um, real joke is that they supplied us with a tuition calculator. Um, this is preschool, and why do we need a tuition calculator to figure out how much it costs for my four-year-old to attend a preschool? You know, I, within reason, it just seems totally off base. And uh, anyway, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for your comment.
Hello, this is Francesco Papali again. Um, while I appreciate what the actions that the council is taking to the vandalism on Solano Avenue, that, that activity is just a small symptom of a greater pattern of extensive violence and and uh, going out or of property damage throughout the city. Um, I think we've all know what have a neighbor who's had a catalytic converter taken from their car. Um, I now, when I order something expensive to be delivered to my home, I spend, I want to make sure that I'm home when it's delivered because the porch pirates will are out in force to take it, it with uh, impunity. Cars must be locked at all times. Last thing I do before I go to bed is double check and use my alarm to make sure that the car is locked. Garages have to be locked to keep our bicycles from being stolen. My neighbor across the street was his house was broken into while they were sleeping upstairs and they'd failed to put the alarm on because they'd never thought someone would break into the basement while they were sleeping upstairs. A woman was followed home from a bank uh, to her neighborhood up by Albany Terrace and was robbed uh, by with a uh, from someone carrying a gun and that gun was fired as well to intimidate the victim. Um, I've lived here for 30 plus years and it's, it's not the safe little town that I came to. It's, uh, I feel like I have to be guarded all the time about uh, where I go, how I go, be very careful about what I do things and how someone might be able to just take it. And um, so I would like the city council to <laughs> ask for the police department to give a quarterly report to the council or maybe even to the policing commission where they can actually give the data of what's been happening uh, throughout the city in very clear statistics and how things have changed year over year. If they're going to report to the policing commission, you might require you to change their work, uh, their work summary for their uh, new commission. But I think it would be a an apt place for the people to uh, for the police to report to the people of what they do to protect us. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hi, good evening. My name is Jeremiah Garrett Pinguello, a fourth generation Albanian. Uh, I'm not sure who else really knows the history of Albany, uh, possibly uh, council member uh, Jennifer. Um, she's third, fourth generation Albany as well. You know, I, I think last year, the memorial building, the, the veterans uh, used to own it, right? But then they couldn't pay their, their bills, so it went up for grabs. And I think the city actually turned down owning the memorial building. So as far as I remember, the memorial building is actually owned by the county, right? So I don't think the city, I mean, can write a letter, sure. But I think the, the memorial building's uh, owned by the county. Uh, the Bill Lewis Senior uh, Teen Center uh, could possibly be owned by the city. But also all the historical items from World War II that were in the memorial building, I hope the city uh, got some of those things and put them in the safe, the, the Albany safe at City Hall for historical reasons. Also, uh, speaking of historical reasons, the land acknowledgement statement uh, regarding the Ohlone tribe, what are, what are we going to do about that? I mean, you read something at the beginning, but I don't see a flag being flown inside this room right now. I see it up on the flagpole outside, but I don't see the Ohlone uh, flag uh, behind city council up on the wall anywhere, or the land, acknowledge, land acknowledgement statement uh, displayed anywhere in this room. So there's some rocks on Albany Hill on the north 
uh, east side by the creek that were there um, next to the shell mounds. So I think Albany could do more uh, regarding the historical value of the Ohlone's. Also regarding uh, uh, unhoused individuals living in the creeks behind Sprouts or anywhere else in Albany. Uh, UC Berkeley has uh, Mr. Ari Newlight. Um, his phone number is 3654394. That's area code 510. He's at UC Berkeley's Department of Social Welfare and he can actually get uh, homeless encampments that are camped in the creek, he can actually get them housing since Albany Cares and the city of Albany um, will not do anything about encampments in the creeks. Um, I have some good news to report. Uh, this Thursday, uh, KCBS radio station is doing a broadcast, 106.9 FM and 7.40 AM, uh, about Elaine's Love program on Thursdays on Solano, 2 to 4 o'clock. Uh, there's been about 500 pounds every week distributed uh, to the community and people in need. So that's it for my time. Thank you for your comment. That's all. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll say on the uh, KSS issue, thank you all for coming. Um, I, to briefly just say, I think there was a staff response to one of the emails we received on that. It's, I'm being hailed to say something. Sure, thank you, Mayor. I did have an opportunity to review the lease. We are lessees or lessors of the KSS preschool, and the lease does not provide for a requirement for cost of service, so the, the tenant is not in breach of the lease. So as lessors, we do not have any ability to regulate the, the lease as it currently stands, and they're not in breach. So there, there would be no provision to provide a letter in terms of the, the landlord-lessee relationship. Thank you for that analysis. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have a lot of legal options, but we'll take this up in uh, future agenda items if there's anything else we can do. Thank you. Um, I believe that brings us to our consent calendar. Um, items on the consent calendar are considered to be routine by the City Council and will be enacted by one motion. By approval of this consent calendar, the staff recommendations will be adopted unless otherwise modified by the City Council. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless a council member or a member of the audience requests uh, so from the consent calendar, do any council members wish to discuss an item separately or pull it from consent? Um, yes, uh, seven, six, seven, 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 eight. Seven, six, seven, seven, and seven, eight. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Any others? Seeing none, um, that will take us to, are there any members of the public who would like to discuss an item separately, which we would just take, which items you would like to discuss if it's already been mentioned. So if it's seven, six, seven, seven, or seven, eight, there'll be a chance for that separately. But for now, just mention which one you would like to have a chance to comment on. Yeah, seven, nine. Thank you, are there any others? Okay, um, with that, we will go to uh, item number seven six. And Councilmember Jordan, I believe this is you. Thank you, yes, and I'll take seven six and seven seven together if that's okay with Please the do. mayor. Uh, I just want to take the opportunity to thank public works staff for um, both catching Albany up on its sanitary sewer rehabilitation program under the consent decree with EPA, and I believe getting us ahead now. Um, I know that the previous public works staff, not this public works staff, uh, didn't get us there. So I'm, I'm very grateful that the current public works staff has made up for that and put us ahead. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who would like to comment on 7-6 and 7-7? Seven, seven? No. Seeing none, that'll take us to 7-8. Um, seven, eight, and just more thanks. I know I can be annoying on this program uh, since I had a hand in getting it going, um, but I want to thank staff for for its work in putting phase seven together and for continuing to get our sidewalks restored. Thank you. Um, are there any comments on this item? No. Uh, with that, I believe that brings us to seven, nine. We had a member of the public who wished to speak on this. Yeah, seven nine. Uh, so that's the uh, Solano Avenue Association. I'm wondering why it says forty five thousand. I know last city council meeting 
on the agenda, it was 35,000. So I'm not sure where the extra $10,000 uh, randomly came in. Um, it would be nice to know if there's gonna be the Ferris wheel and the carnival this year, because I know that's a big expense. So maybe that extra $10,000 is for that. Uh, but it's kind of interesting how last agenda item it was 35,000 and now all of a sudden it's 45,000. Quite a mystery. Um, so I was just kind of wondering why the city manager doesn't know the budget of the ARPA funds, considering this agenda item is going to be taking potentially $45,000 from the ARPA budget. And there's all these burglaries on Solano taking money from the same fund. So it'd be nice to know if the city manager would actually know how much money is, is in that account. That way we know, could we give $45,000 from that to Solano Avenue Association and pay, help pay for all these businesses getting robbed? I mean, we gotta know how much money's in there. It's kind of odd all this stuff going on and, and nobody has any idea how much money is in that account. Seems kind of like the smart thing to do to be organized and know where the money's coming from and how much you're able to spend before making any decisions like seven and nine. You wanna spend $45,000, but you don't know how much money is in the account. It doesn't make sense to me. So I don't see how you could approve this agenda item and not know how much money is in the account. It seems kind of unorganized. Um, and I just don't know where the extra $10,000 came from randomly all of a sudden. Um, like I said, the last agenda, the city council meeting was 35,000. Now all of a sudden it's 45,000. It says that there's an increase and also there's all these crimes going on in Solano and it's all using the same money. I know Solano Avenue uh, Association, I know the Solano Stroll is great for our business district. It's probably the best thing for our business district that, that there is. So it's a good use of money for sure. Um, but it would just be really nice to know how much money is in that account. All right, thanks. That's, that's it. Thank you for your comment. Uh, to answer the question, the ask from the Solano Avenue Association was for $35,000, but there was a feeling from council that they had lowballed what they might need. Uh, so there was a uh, motion to give them more uh, than they asked for, and that was accepted by council. So what's coming back is what council directed staff to develop, which is funding for $45,000 for the stroll um, and like events. Um, also on knowing what we have left in ARPA funds, I don't think anyone, even our finance director, would know off the top of our head the balance of every city fund, um, but know that we are managing it uh, responsibly and uh, it, you know, it's complicated, but we are doing our due diligence. Do you have something to add? Yeah, I would just add that um, in response to another council member's question, or actually it was the vice mayor's question of the executive director of the Solano Avenue Association, um, we learned that the association, if I recall correctly, had taken out it's either two hundred thousand or two hundred fifty thousand dollar loan, um, because of the uh, financial hole that had been put in due to the pandemic. Um, so, upon learning that, the council felt that uh, making a larger contribution to help that organization recover, which is the purpose of the ARPA funds, was in order. Thank you. Uh, if there are no other comments on anything on the consent agenda, I will take a motion. I will move the consent calendar. I'll second. There is a motion and a second. Can we please call the roll? Councilmember Jordan? Yes. Councilmember Lopez? Yes. Vice Mayor Mickey? Yes. Mayor Tiedemann? Yes. And Councilmember Hanson Romero? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. This brings us to uh, item 9-1, our public hearing, um, which is considering adoption of the general plan and approval of the addendum to our EIR. Um, before we get into the public hearing, I'm going to throw it over to uh, the city attorney to uh, just describe briefly a little bit of a uh, how this process is gonna work, and then I'll walk us through the agenda that we're gonna follow as it's a little different than we'd usually do it. 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we do have a conflict of interest from Vice Mayor Mickey, who owns property, residential rental property at 805 and 807 Buchanan Street. It's a duplex. Because of this conflict of interest um, and his desire to participate in the housing element, uh, the conflict relates to the tenant protection issues that are in the housing element. The law allows us to segment that decision from the rest of the housing element and allows Council Vice Mayor Mickey, excuse me, to participate in the rest of the housing element. But we do have to go through a unique process in which the council takes action on the tenant protection issues first without Vice Mayor Mickey in the room, without him participating, and then he will be able to participate in the rest of the housing element, and including voting on the housing element should you desire to include the tenant protection issues in the housing element. Thank you. Um, so to reiterate, we are going to get a presentation from staff that's omitting some of the tenant protection issues and then council questions on that. Vice Mayor Mickey will then leave the room uh, and we will get the final bit of the presentation on tenant protections council questions, and then public comments on those tenant protections, so only on that specific part of the housing element. Um, we will then discuss and do any votes that need to be taken. Vice Mayor Mickey will then return. Uh, we will have public comments on the rest of the housing element, so please, as best you can, sort your comments. Um, I know this uh, may be difficult to do, as you may have planned out, assuming you had three minutes uninterrupted on one issue. If we had known earlier, we would have told everybody, but this is sort of late breaking. Uh, we will then close the public hearing and deliberate and vote on the entirety of the housing element with uh, Vice Mayor Mickey in the room. Did I get that all correct? Great. You did. Um, Wait, question? if I could, yeah, if I could clarify. So there'll be one vote on the entire element, including the tenant protections? After we have settled any questions about the tenant protections right. without Vice Mayor Mickey present. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Yes. And I, and I just want to be clear, when you do settle any issues on the tenant protection issues, that needs to be a final action. You can't go back and revisit it because now Vice Mayor Mickey... Okay, that makes more sense. Okay, I was, I was confused. So, that's how we so there will be a vote on the tenant protection be, portion. There'll be a, a vote of, but some, then of some, yeah. of some okay. decision, and then that vote will be... Locked in. Locked yeah. in. Okay. And, then, and then when you vote on the housing element, it'll include whatever you do okay. on that. Okay. Thank you. And, and once we get there, I'll say a little bit more about how I think that process is going to work. Um, but we wanted to get that all out there. Um, great. Without any further ado, I believe we have a presentation from staff and our consultant. Yes. Good. Yes. Good evening, uh, Council. My name is Jeff Bond. I'm the Community Development Director. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction, then turn it over to our consultant, Barry Miller. Um, and if you have a chance to promote us over here on Zoom so that we can make a presentation, uh, that would be great. While well, I'll, I'll do the, I just wanted to give a little bit of context um, for a little bit of the historical context for housing elements. Um, housing elements have been required by state law since 1969 as part of our general plan. They've, the laws about this have evolved over time. Um, we last in Albany certified a housing element in 2015, and beginning particularly in 2017, a series of new laws were passed by the state legislature and signed by the governor that have really dramatically changed and, and made housing elements um, more thorough, more complicated uh, procedurally, and, and I think more useful as a tool to address some of the challenges that we face in the Bay Area and in California in general about housing market conditions. Um, it's no secret to everybody that um, conditions have changed dramatically. We're seeing um, job growth and population growth in increasing faster than the growth in the number of housing units. And there are a lot of different reasons for that. Not all the city's fault, but cities do have an important role, and the housing element is the place where we can address that more than anything else. Um, so um, hopefully through the policies that uh, you'll be looking at this evening, will have uh, begin to address the issues such as uh, segregation, long commutes, overcrowded housing, expensive housing, and so forth. Um, and this would be a framework for us to work on for the next eight years. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, um, to Barry to make a presentation. Are you, so Anne, you weren't able to get us? Okay. Anyways, I'll, I'll share. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Okay, thanks, and I think we can advance to the next slide and then one more slide after this because we have changed our protocol.
for the evening. And good evening, council members and members of the public. I'm Barry Miller, uh, the consultant on the Albany housing element update. Happy to be here this evening in person. Uh, Jeff mentioned that this is not a new requirement. This is something that California cities and counties have been doing for over 50 years. You're reading a lot more about it in the paper now, and there are a lot more eyes on what we're doing, and the bar is much higher than it used to be. The consequences of not getting certified are also a lot greater than they used to be. Uh, so uh, just a couple of points on here, and, and uh, this is the only part of Albany's general plan that is subject to certification by a state agency, so we are required to submit this document after it's adopted to the State Department of Housing and Community Development. They will review it and ensure that it complies with the government code. Uh, the requirements for the housing element are very prescriptive and much more detailed than any other part of the general plan. So I'm sure you noticed, and members of the public as well, that this is uh, several hundred pages of content. A lot of the content is data that's required by the state, a lot of maps that are required by the state, uh, and some of the policies and program topic areas are really dictated by the state of California in this case. Uh, there is also a kind of a paradigm shift in the way this element is structured in that it focuses on affirmatively furthering fair housing. And what that means is that uh, it's not business as usual anymore. We have to make sure that we're providing for the housing needs of all of our residents and not concentrating all of our affordable housing in a single location or at the regional level in a single community. So. Um, Communities that have been uh, characterized as high resource communities are having to bear a larger share of the region's housing needs in the future. Uh, the point at the bottom right of the slide I think is really important, which is that your responsibility as a city is not to actually build housing. Your responsibility is to write the rules that allow the private sector to build housing. And uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, great, thank you. So this is a timeline, it's a little bit complicated with a lot of milestones and dates, but I think the point we wanted to make here is that this process has been going on for about two years. Uh, the responsibility for most of the public input was delegated to the Planning and Zoning Commission. They convened eight study sessions between the beginning of 2021 and uh, the fall of 2022, and each of those study sessions took up a different topic area, such as housing needs, constraints to housing production, housing sites, and so forth. Uh, you, you as a city council, though some different folks on the council at that time, uh, held three study sessions last year, and uh, we held a community workshop in late 2021, uh, made a number of other presentations to community groups. Some of the key dates on this slide are on July 29th of last year, so uh, roughly six months ago, we produced uh, the first draft of this document, it's called the HCD draft, and we're required by state law to submit a draft of the housing element to the state before we even adopt it. The state has, um, well first we have to circulate that draft for 30 days, which we did. There was a council hearing on that draft. Changes were made at that time. It was submitted to the state on September 12th, and 90 days later we received a letter back from the state saying, you're almost there, but you're not quite there yet. You need to make some strategic changes to your document. They told us exactly what they wanted to see changed, and those revisions have been made, and that's why that brings us to this evening's meeting. We did have a meeting with the Planning and Zoning Commission on February 8th as the, a general plan amendment. They're required to make a recommendation to the council before you take action on the item, and they did at that point uh, move to recommend the council adopt the housing element at this, uh, this evening's meeting. So we can go to the next slide, please. So one of the drivers behind the housing element is what's called the Regional Housing Needs Allocation. The acronym for that is RENA, and uh, you'll hear a lot about the RENA uh, in, in the presentation. We, um, the arena is the number of units for which the city must plan. So we need to demonstrate to the state that we're planning for, uh, in this case, 1,114 housing units over an eight year period. Uh, so that's a 233% increase over the arena from the last eight year cycle. You can see on the slide 
the arena for the last uh, four, with the three cycles preceding this one, and then the tall bar in the slide is the current arena, uh, which is over 1,000 units. So the reasons for the increase are an increased need for and demand for housing, lack of housing production, and the change in the methodology, which really carries forward some of the unmet housing need from the last cycle. Uh, that need is broken down into different income categories. So you can see on here there's a segment that's for very low income, a segment for low income, moderate, and above moderate. And just to kind of benchmark those terms, the uh, income limit for a low-income household of four in the, bay, in the East Bay is $109,400. So if your household income is less than that and you're a four-person household, you are considered a lower-income household. Next slide, please. The contents of the housing element, and I, I'll add here because we have already done a uh, couple of presentations to the council last year on each of these chapters. Uh, we're not going to go through all of this again tonight. We're really going to focus tonight's presentation on what was changed from the last time the council took up the housing element and considered it and how we responded to the state's comments. So um, there are six chapters in the document. The first five are really background information, a lot of, again, a lot of data and analysis looking at what our housing needs are, where our housing opportunities are, and what the constraints are to building housing in Albany. And I'll emphasize it's very much a document about housing production, about removing obstacles to getting housing built in the city. Uh, there are goals, policies, and programs in Chapter 6. That's kind of the core of the housing element and where our action plan is. And that's really where the, um, most of the focus is because that essentially says, here's what we're going to do in the next eight years to meet our housing needs. There are also a number of appendices in the document. The fair housing analysis uh, meets the state requirements and looks at patterns of uh, segregation in the city and uh, patterns of poverty over time. The site's inventory is a very detailed inventory of every property in Albany that's viable as a housing site. And the San Pablo Avenue corridor density study, we chose to do that to demonstrate to the state that we as a city do have the possibility of building these units in our community. Uh, it's happening in Berkeley, it's happening in El Cerrito and other communities along that corridor and potentially other locations in Albany. The kinds of development and densities that we're required to do are feasible even though we, don't, we haven't seen a whole lot of that development lately in the city. Next slide, please. So this is just a recap of the six goals that are in the housing element. Uh, the first goal deals with equitable access to housing in all of our neighborhoods. Second is really about housing production and building housing that meets the needs of the entire community. Third is specifically dealing with persons with special needs. This may be unhoused residents or older adults or persons with disabilities who have housing needs that aren't typically met in the private market. Uh, next is eliminating or reducing constraints that create barriers to the cost of housing. Fifth is minimizing displacement in the community and promoting fair housing. And last is increasing our financial resources for affordable housing in the city and looking at potential new funding sources and ways to get housing built. Next slide, please. So we did submit the document to the state last September. We received a six-page comment letter. I will say um, that relative to some of the other cities in the Bay Area, that's a short comment letter. We're often seeing 12, 13, 14-page comment letters. Uh, and Jeff and I met with the reviewer who said, uh, you, you guys are pretty close with your current draft, uh, but we want you to do a little bit more work on some specific points. Uh, first, they wanted us to, and, and by the way, there were 25 comments, but I'm kind of grouping them here into these batches. One group of comments dealt with our housing sites. So we're a dense, urban, built-out city. Most of our sites are already developed properties. And they basically said, demonstrate to us that those are realistic places for housing to be built based on market conditions, based on what you're seeing in the community, based on various metrics that you can uh, point to. And so we did that as part of the revisions. Uh, next, they wanted to, us to take a deeper look at constraints related to our development and permitting processes. 
Are there things that we're doing, requirements that we have that maybe make it more difficult or expensive for a developer to come in and build in Albany? Uh, next, and probably the most impactful comment, is that they felt that our programs were not sufficiently actionable or measurable. We had a lot of programs where we said we were going to consider doing something or to study doing something or to explore doing something, but not enough where we were actually doing something. So we, I believe, were very strategic in going through the element and identifying those actions where it was possible to make a firm commitment. I will say we didn't do that on every single action. Some of, them, some of these really are studies or things that we need to get further community input and further community discussion before we make a commitment. And so uh, I would say we were judicious in identifying those policies and programs that had more specific language. And we did also add metrics and timelines to a number of the programs. Uh, the state doesn't like when you say a particular action is ongoing. They want to see a date. They want to see a number and so forth. Uh, they also asked us to show how our programs were furthering fair housing in the city, and we added information on that. Uh, you'll see in the packet for this evening that we prepared detailed responses to each of their comments and also a track change version of the document we submitted last September showing every change that was made to the draft and how it addresses their comment. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to go through a couple of highlights without getting into detail on the changes that were made. The um, chapters four and five, four is the sites analysis and five is the constraints analysis. Uh, we did, I mentioned, add additional data on our non-vacant sites, our small sites. One of the things the state said is, gee, a lot of your housing sites are pretty small, less than half an acre. Uh, how many units can you realistically get on some of those smaller sites? So we had to provide some data to them. Uh, we also have a number of, most of our multifamily sites are mixed use sites. So you can build commercial, you can build residential, or you can build both. And they said, prove to us that those sites are actually going to develop with housing. What incentives are you providing to make housing viable on those sites? So we had to add additional information on that. Uh, there was additional information provided on infrastructure, on potential sites for emergency shelter, on the processing times for recent multifamily projects, and on the permitting requirements for large residential care facilities. So these are residential care facilities with seven people or more that currently require a use permit, uh, and looking at ways that that process can be expedited. Next slide. We did, as I mentioned, come up with more actionable verbs wherever we could, uh, so that instead of considering more proactive code enforcement, we're going to develop more code enforcement. Uh, this is an eight-year plan, and some of these things may not happen tomorrow, but this is something that the city is committing to do over the next eight years. There is an annual progress report that's required as part of the housing element, so we will be coming back to the Planning and Zoning Commission and to the City Council each year with an update on how the city is doing and actually carrying out these different programs. Next slide. There were more specific metrics added to a number of the programs. And again, these were not just random numbers or arbitrary targets. In most cases, there is a rational basis for coming up with what these metrics are, uh, such as looking at the percentage of uh, minor home repair, repair grant loans that would, those are, these are county loans that would go to Albany if we received our prorated share based on the, our population relative to the county. So in each case, we tried to add a metric that made sense and that was achievable. Next slide. There were also a number of new programs that were added to the document. These were specifically listed in the state's comments, uh, allowing multifamily housing by right, in other words, without a, a discretionary decision or a use permit. Um, and that's something that we are required to do on sites that we're carrying over from the last housing element. So there are a number of our housing sites that didn't get developed in this cycle that we're moving forward and we need to um, create some streamlining provisions for housing on those sites in the future. In most cases, those provisions already exist through the San Pablo Avenue specific plan, uh, but that is now part of the element. 
Uh, the objective standards for residential care, I mentioned that priority for um, sewer service to affordable projects. This is state law, and uh, in our initial draft, we didn't feel it was necessary to cite state law, but the state wants to see that in our element, that we will grant priority to projects with affordable units when providing sewer service. Uh, and then lastly, that we will uh, require replacement housing if a residential project displaces residential units that are occupied by lower income households. Next slide. So we're gonna skip this slide based on the uh, city attorney's comments and move right on to the EIR addendum. I will um, just say quickly that this is a general plan amendment and is defined as a project under the California Environmental Quality Act. Uh, we determined that it was not necessary to do a new EIR, that the general plan EIR that was certified in 2016 was adequate to address the impacts of adopting this housing element. Uh, there are no changes to the land use map for the city of Albany that are being implemented as part of this. There are some actions in the housing element that could require environmental review at some point in the future, uh, and that would be associated with some of the recommendations on Albany Hill and on individual projects. Those projects would still be subject to um, subsequent environmental review. But at this point, this is a programmatic document that's not changing our general plan in a substantive way that would require um, an EI, a new EIR. So there's an addendum that's been prepared to the existing EIR. Next slide. So the resolution that you have before you this evening makes a number of findings that I just want to point out. Um, you will come back to this later in the meeting. Uh, first, you're going to be uh, asked to find that the adoption of this document is compliant with the California Environmental Quality Act that adoption is in the public interest and consistent with the guiding principles of the Albany General Plan. Uh, you need to find that the non-vacant sites are not an impediment to meeting the city's regional housing needs allocation. Again, that's a state law that you include that finding in the document. It's backed up by a lot of data in the actual uh, housing element. Uh, and you need to find that the document is substantially compliant based on the fact that we have responded to all of the HCD comments and gone through a government code checklist which identifies where every requirement in the California government code related to housing elements has been met. So those are all part of the resolution. Uh, when this is approved, there will be both a track change copy and a clean copy transmitted to the state. And both of those are part of, they're both referenced as exhibits to the resolution. Uh, next slide, please. So there was, I mentioned, a hearing of the Planning and Zoning Commission about two weeks ago, and they approved their resolution recommending council adoption of the housing element. They did uh, recommend a few minor changes at that meeting including a program edit to allow the Planning and Zoning Commission to approve density bonus requests rather than having to have a separate hearing of the City Council for that. And that's something that um, removes one of the hearing requirements and would expedite development. Uh, they suggested that we look at requiring some of the, the inclusionary housing units in future projects to be uh, ADA accessible that we specifically mention the potential for triplexes and fourplexes in the R1 zoning district as something to be looked at in the future, and that we acknowledge that we allow a higher uh, development footprint, basically a fl higher floor area ratio for projects that are residential uh, than we do for commercial, and that's in response to one of the state's comments. Uh, there were 10 public speakers at that meeting, and uh, most of the commentary was relating to a specific program on tenant protection. Next slide, and this is the last slide. Uh, so the next steps would be really uh, to either adopt the element as it currently is drafted, in which case it would be submitted to the state tomorrow, which begins a 60-day review process. Uh, if you make changes to the housing element, and that could be deletion of a program or addition of a program or editing of a program, uh, we are required to then post the document to the city's website for seven days prior to submitting it to the state. So that would push us out to March 1st in, in terms of our submittal date. Um, once the state gets this document, they have 60 days to issue a, a findings letter to the city, which will either say, 
you're in compliance and you're done. You just start implementing your element. Uh, or they will contact us toward the end of the 60 days and say, you know, we, we want you to make some minor tweaks to the document that are not substantive, that can be done uh, kind of at an administrative level, in which case we would ad advise the council that that was being done, but it would not necessarily be a public hearing item. Uh, or we receive a letter at the end saying, you're not quite there yet, and we uh, want to see additional revisions, in which case we would make those revisions and then bring this back through the Planning and Zoning Commission and bring it back to the City Council, uh, likely in May of this year. Uh, we are hopeful that we've adequately responded to the comments and we'll get that compliance determination at the end of the 60 days. And I think the next slide is the final slide and we thank you and are happy to answer questions on everything but tenant protection items right now. Thank you for the presentation. Um, we will now go to council questions on anything we've just heard or anything about the non-tenant protection issues. We will get to that next. Um, are there any council members with questions on this part? Okay, I have one um, or two. Um, so I, I asked you both about this earlier, but I just wanted to clarify on the record for uh, program 1A, which is about allowing more units in R1 zoning. How does, the, you know, how does what we're proposing to develop relate to SB9, which allows a certain number of units, I think four, developed on any property with a subdivision? Right, we're gonna, Jeff and I were just saying we're gonna tag team our responses, so you may hear from both of, both of us on some of these. Didn't have it any other uh, way. Great. <laughs> Uh, I think the, the language that we've included goes a step beyond SB9. The SB9 is not really producing much in the way of uh, two, three, four unit buildings in most cities. And I think the Turner Center even said we only expect one or two percent of our housing stock is going to see any impact. Um, this would create some standards that would make it uh, potentially make it easier to do two, three, and four units. We don't know the full extent because we haven't had that conversation with the community or looked at uh, what's feasible and possible. And so um, it's hard to say how much beyond that would go, but the intent is to go a little bit further than what the state law currently requires. Thank you. Um, uh, one other question um, from the presentation. You mentioned that you, know, you were being judicious about what you added additional timelines and requirements into. But I wanted to clarify because the state letter did specifically note uh, the programs that they thought we needed uh, some additional forceful language on, and that and they noted specifically what some of those needed of you know which ones needed timelines, which needed something more actionable, and I believe we've made improvements on each and every one of them that they identified and said you need to do X, Y, or Z on this. Correct? Um, yes, except for the the Topa program, which. Yeah, that one was not changed at all. Right, so that was, I don't believe that they, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe they said this needs specific timelines. They identified that as a possible conservation measure in another part of the comments. Correct. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions on this part? Um, actually, I'd like to know a little bit more. About, there was some mention of housing choice vouchers. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that? Sure, that is what we used to call the Section 8 program, which is essentially where you're getting a voucher that pays your landlord 30% uh, of your, uh, you pay 30% of your income on rent and the government makes up the difference through a voucher. So this is, we are able to increase, because I understand that, it, that housing vouchers are very short. They are. They are, yes. Yeah. So we've set an aspirational goal of increasing the number of vouchers that we get as a city. Um, we can't control whether we get those or not other than lobbying and um, making the case for why Albany needs to have a greater share of vouchers and letting folks know that this is a program, uh, it's, it's administered at the county level. So, but the number overall in Albany has been going down. It's now only 12 vouchers that are in use oh, in the city. I think it was over 30 at the time of the last housing element, so, yeah. Okay. And um, just one other quick question. Is, um, are we preventing any sort of creative use in any of these 
potential buildings that might not just include housing but other types of projects that would also include housing? Uh, no, I think we're encouraging uh, other types of creative uses that would, as, if they include housing. I think that's the, that's the key. And the housing site list is not limited. I mean, we, if, if there is a uh, other use on one of these housing sites that comes up, we're able to consider that use as long as we have sufficient capacity on the, re on the rest of the sites to meet our assignment. And from my understanding, you, uh, we've targeted more than the percentage that we were. Yeah, yes, we have about a 30% buffer on our sites. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Barry, I just wanted to uh, verify this, but the housing element, I mean, it sets um, ambitious programs, steps that we as a community must do, but in no way does it necessarily limit us in terms of as we explore some of these topics after the housing element is adopted to actually go further. Is that correct? So for instance, the study of R1, talk about two to four units, that's not necessarily limiting us to two to four units. It's simply saying that we would begin by studying that. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. You can go beyond what the housing element says, yes. And in the same way, the housing element, as you described, identifies sites for potential housing development that includes up to 30% above and beyond. But in no way does that prevent the city from either uh, changing the zoning in more of the city and or accepting projects that would allow us to actually create more housing. Yeah, you certainly can create projects on sites that aren't identified in the housing element. You did that actually with the last cycle. The, the Saha project, for example, is on a site that we did not identify in the last housing element, and you'd be encouraged to do that in the future. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll note on the question on housing vouchers that uh, I believe Albany's representative, former uh, council member Peggy McQuaid, is the chair of the body that administers that at the county level, so we are well represented on that. Yeah. Um, any other questions before we uh, move to the next bit of this and lose one of our number for a little bit? Seeing none, uh, Vice Mayor Mickey, we will send someone out to get you in a little while. Um, I think I legally have to say, so I'm just making sure that I make this statement. Uh, so I'm recusing myself from the discussion uh, that will be happening uh, after this because I have a financial interest in a property at 805-807 Buchanan Street, uh, and as such, I will recuse myself from discussion of tenant protections. Thank you. Uh, and while he's leaving, I'll again go over some the process here. Um, we will now have presentation from staff that covers the slide we skipped on tenant protections. Uh, then we will have questions from the council on tenant protections, uh, and then we will have public comments on tenant protections, um, which to clarify, if you are here about TOPA, as I imagine many of you are, given the emails we got, this that co public comment period is the time to talk about it. Um, and, uh, it's, it's important that we not overlap on public comment um, between this public comment period and the one we will do later on the entire housing element because what needs to be said now needs to not be said with Vice Mayor Mickey in the room. Um, and there'll be a little bit more process when we start discussing, um, but I think that covers it. So can we please go back to our presentation on the tenant protection part? Yes, I'm, uh, bear with me as we get to that one slide that we skipped over earlier. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so when we brought this, uh, the housing element to the City Council and to the Planning and Zoning Commission last uh, summer, uh, most of the comments from the public related to tenant protection issues, and we did want to highlight some of those because indeed for tonight's meeting as well, most of the comments that were received in advance of the meeting related to this, uh, to TOPA specifically, but uh, also to tenant protection measures more generally. Um, so the housing element did include a needs assessment that indicated that 61% of the lower income households in Albany are cost burdened, meaning that they're paying more than 30% of their incomes in rent. 50% uh, of the very low income households in the city are paying more than 50% of their incomes in rent. So we do have a large percentage of our population that is cost burdened. There were also uh, maps of displacement risks that were produced that are in the housing element that show a relatively high uh, risk of displacement in Albany as prices go up. 
and the state does require that we include anti-displacement measures in our housing element. That's part of the AB 686, the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule. Also, as part of the outreach in the housing element, we did hear from a number of organizations that tenant protection measures in the city uh, needed to be revisited and that there needed to be some action programs in the housing element that dealt with issues related to uh, our renters and the needs of renters in Albany. Uh, there are several programs in the housing element that address tenant protection, 5C, 5D, and 5E are the primary pr uh, measures, the primary programs. 5C uh, calls for a look at our rent review process, and this was a carry, this was a program that was in the draft that was sent up to the state. They basically said, we'd like to see more proactive language. Uh, and this is something where we said in our response that we would uh, evaluate the current rent review process and then take action depending on the findings of that evaluation. 5D is a, a series of potential tenant protection measures that could be explored by the city following adoption of the housing element. The language there was uh, strengthened to say that the city will review these different measures and then take appropriate actions once it has had that conversation with housing providers and with tenants and with various advocacy groups. Uh, 5E, which is a tenant opportunity to purchase or TOPA uh, Act, which was um, initially in the, the housing element uh, removed and then added back in during the council meeting in September. Uh, we did not edit that or change that at all in the current draft that's before you this evening. So what you're seeing this, in this evening's draft is the same language that was in the draft that was sent up to the state last uh, September. Uh, we essentially, I think, wanted to say that this is intended to be a starting point for a community conversation, and it is not intended to be a solution. There's uh, nothing in the housing element that will go into effect this, the, when this is adopted, it's essentially committing the city to a process, to a feasibility study, and to a community discussion about the needs of tenants, the needs of landlords and housing providers, and ways to work together and come up with solutions that work for everyone. And uh, that essentially is where we are right now, and I know there's a lot of interest in this subject based on the emails we've received on both sides. And if I may I just add to uh, Barry's presentation on this, um, and particularly for our new council members, I think the tenant protection measures issue has been by far the item that's gotten the most um, correspondence over the planning process. Um, we attempted in, in your packet to attach all the written correspondence that we've received in the last couple of years. Um, and and um, I know that over the weekend you have received a steady stream of emails, and I know that council looks at those just wanted to assure members of the public that, that those do get to you directly when they come in. And um, I'm sure will be part of your, your reflection on, on next steps with this document. Thank you. Um, any questions from council on uh, this section of the housing element? Yes, thank you. Um, the council has received in some messages a suggestion to essentially remove program 5D. Um, in your professional opinion, would the state approve a housing element that didn't have program 5D or something close to it? Can I just clarify five? So 5D is the runner, the whole suite of runner protection measures? Yeah, I'll get to 5E. <laughs> okay, you haven't gotten to 5E. Yeah. All right. Um, so yes, I, I do think that the state would have an issue if we removed 5D. Okay. Yes. Okay. I mean, that was my understanding, but... You're the professional, so. Yes. Um, and so then the same question, 5E, which is TOPA. They likely would not have the same issue with 5E as they would with 5 I think 5D is broader. Mm -hmm. And potentially that discussion under 5D could include a TOPA program as something that's looked at in the future. Um, I mean, at 5, 5D is a very broad program that essentially says you're going to look at this issue now and then ongoing in the future. Yeah, so in that regard, it says develop and implement, and this is, I guess, further clarification on comments that, that some of the comments that came in, develop and implement tenant protection measures. Um, you know, it's hard to know 
always in written comment what somebody's thinking exactly, but I got the impression some think that if this were adopted with program 5D the way it's written now, then we would essentially be adopting all of the elements that it lays out as options tonight. Um, in other words, rent control. If we, if we pass this tonight, then we're passing rent control. Uh, I, that's not the intent of this program, and I don't think that that's, a presum that's the presumed outcome. I think it's the, the outcome is that you will look at the issue and take some action that you determine is appropriate based on what you, what you hear and what you learn. At a future date. Right. Right. Okay. Um, what percentage, and you may have to look some stuff up, one or the other of you, uh, um, what percentage of the residences that are for rent are single detached in Albany out of this total number of res or total number of residences are rented, I guess otherwise known as houses. But I try not to, I like to just use residences because it's generic to house, condo, apartment. Um, so single, single detached. About 20% of the total rental stock in the city. Okay, thank you. Wow, you do have the right off the top of your head. Impressive, all right, that's all my questions, thank you. Um, let's see, it was coming to mind now. Um, actually, so on, on that note, I think I looked up uh, at one point, but can you remind me how many um, are absentee owners in Albany, like including the single family? That we don't, I, I don't have data on the number of absentee owners. I don't know, Jeff, if that's a, something the city has. By absentee owners, are you? Uh, Tenant occupied units usually oh. are, you know, okay. regardless of whether they might be Airbnb, I don't know. But. Um, there are, well, I, I think this is answering your question. Um, 704, according to our data, 704 renter occupied single family homes. Mm -hmm. Is that getting to you? Well, your... just not the single family, but also the, including apartments or. Oh, um, so, so there are roughly 4,000 rental units in the city. Um, I, when you said absentee, I wasn't sure if you... Sorry, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Non-owner occupied. <laughs> yeah, it's about 4,000. It's roughly 50%. Yeah. And, and that includes UC Village. Right. But UC Village isn't included as far as our, um, our housing stock, per se? It, it depends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's certainly part of the city. It's part of the, the data. I think it probably contributed to the, the city's allocation, the arena allocation. Um, there's a, there is evolving treatment of student housing by the state. Um, historically, we have counted it as housing. Um, that is, appears to be changing. And because in at least certain elements of the certain elements of the state feel as though that's group housing, which isn't regular housing. Um, I think in our case, I have a little bit of a quarrel with that because basically what's being constructed in Albany are standard apartments. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, but it, so there's no clean, simple, straight answer to your question, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> well, and yeah, I was just trying to get some background on that because I've heard over the years, like it was counted as some of the affordable units and then it was not allowed to be counted because it wasn't technically so and it's changing. The, the, the rules are changing over time. Okay. okay. If, if I can add, the, the state has expressly said to us, you cannot count the proposed student housing at UC Village as meeting your RENA number. So they, they've already, because we, we went to them initially and said, you know, we've got these units that are going to come online. They're going to be affordable mm -hmm. to lower income households. Can we count them, their apartments? And the answer was no. And then the current Saha project going on, is that included in this? It is. The Saha project and the Albany Bowl project are both included. Okay. And then one other, sorry, last question. So now it sounds like uh, 5E, um, based upon some of the other housing elements in other cities that have not included TOPA, that is not something that is required within the housing element to happen. Correct. Uh, no, it is not required. 
It's not, I mean, we found it in the El Cerrito housing element and the Oakland housing element, but uh, interestingly, it was taken out of the Berkeley housing element. Okay, I believe, yeah, and Emeryville didn't include it, right. nor did Piedmont, correct? Correct. Yeah, thank you. Thank you uh, very much for your insight and information so far and fellow council members for questions. Um, I'll keep mine brief because uh, I'm assuming everyone in the room just anxious to share thoughts. <laughs> and um, one of the first things that uh, popped up to me, you know, I see state law requires anti-displacement measures. Um, is there anything that would prevent us, whether we push this housing element forward for approval um, with edits or not, that would stop us from looking or exploring other anti, into other anti-displacement measures. Do we have uh, any restrictions around that? If we, if city staff comes up with a unique solution or someone on council uh, in a later year comes up with something completely different, um, or is there anything that prevents us from doing that? Um, no, I think as long as it's, is, it's consistent with state law, you can be creative and come up with other ideas and proposals. There's nothing related to specifically to what's in the housing element that would prevent you from thinking about other, other uh, approaches as long as it's legal. Thank you. Um, and then my second and final question, I'm aware that uh, tenant use of echo housing resources is relatively low. Um, is there any indication around that, you know, around why that's so, and how that could be further increased uh, in future years so that uh, tenants are aware of what their protected rights are? Um, I, I can address that. I think, it, I think they're busy. And um, what our practice has been is, is helping tenants get connected to Echo Housing. Sometimes the first phone call takes a while to get a return or an email, the first email takes a little while to get a response. We are more than happy to step in and, and um, follow up on behalf of anybody that's having trouble getting hold of them. I think it's just because their services are in demand more than anything else. Um, and yeah. we, we can, we can continue to do that, and, and we don't really need the housing element policy to do that. It's, it's just a matter of our, our regular practice. Um, yeah, just following up on Council Member um, Hans Romero's question about Saha and the Albany Bull Project, are those, are those under the previous housing cycle, or are they on, under this one? I mean, which one do they count towards? No, they, they'll count up for the, they're for this cycle because they will come online during the planning period, which started July 1st, 2022. Okay. And so is it when the certificate of occupancy is issued rather than like the building permit or the planning approval? I mean, what, what's the date at which? Uh, it's based on, the, on when the CO is, uh, is issued. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, and then I, I just got to ask, so your understanding is that the allocation to Albany was based on including University Village, but then we're not allowed to include University Village for, for the housing production. So it's kind of like tails you win, heads you lose. I mean, tails we win, heads you lose situation. <laughs> That's my understanding of the formulas that, that drove the, the regional housing needs allocation. That's right. Wow. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and and I, you know, we we need to get this document completed, and then um, I think our colleagues in the city of Berkeley share the same um, uh, frustration with this, and, and we could perhaps yeah, explore I mean, what we can do about that. Obviously, basic economics. Students are competing for housing. I mean, they're part of the, part of what's yeah. Anyway, sounds like we should join our join our. Uh, well, so will that be handled at the staff level, do you think, with, with Berkeley, or what's the? I, I think that's to be determined. Okay. Um, right. I wouldn't hesitate to call on council leadership if that's where we need to go to make change. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Please do. Okay, if there are no other questions, um, I believe this will bring us to public comment, and we will open the public hearing. Um, a reminder, 
this is about the tenant protections portion of the housing element. Please reserve your comments to that portion. There will be a chance later to talk about the housing element uh, as a whole. Um, and, you know, to that point, you don't need to take up the full uh, time that you are allotted. If you want to just cover part of your comments and then cover the rest of them later, perfectly acceptable. Um, so we will now go to public comment. If I can ask the um, public commenter in the uh, on Zoom, if they are not commenting on the tenant protection part, if you can lower your hand for now. Thank you. Um, for in the room, Peter Pan, George, Judy, and Michael, if you could line up. Thank you. So is 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 Topa part of the topic? I'm here to speak yes, uh, now against Topa. Talk about Topa. Okay. Yeah, I, I speak on behalf of Bound um, Business and uh, Housing Network. Um, I'm a real estate broker in, in my Albany, El Cerrito, Berkeley, and Richmond are my target area. In my 30 years of career, I have helped many, many tenants find housing. And I found no discrimination whether you are a tenant or you are otherwise. But the tenant who are still being tenants, not a house, house owner, they have two, I, I find it, they have two categories. One is they are financially capable, but they'd rather be renting, you know, it's easier. The second part is they want to buy a house, but they don't have the financial means. And so that's why they cannot buy a house. How Topa help these two group of people? For the first one, they are not willing to be landlord, you know, that's out of question. For the second one, unless Topa somehow lower, down, lower the housing price, distort the market, you know, so that the landlord will sell them cheaper. Otherwise, it just does nothing, right? Um, and Topa, in its sense of, gives the tenant the first right of refusal in purchasing the property. And that could complicate your yeah, transaction a lot. Suppose I got a listing and I have a buyer and I tell them that you make the offer but it has subject to somebody, the tenant. They have to approve it and things like that. What do you think the, the, the chance they're going to make an offer? They will wait. So they prolong the, the buying, selling process. They make it so complicated, they create more costs. And end up, probably the owner is not going to get a fair market value out of that. Now we try to encourage people to build more ADUs so that more people can run out. But if we put in this program, we're essentially saying that don't do that. Because if you have a tenant and if you want to sell a house, you are going to go through a lot of difficulties. So this goes totally against our goal. And this is the unintended consequence of TOPA. So please, don't include it in your housing element because it's not going to do any good. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. George? Good evening, council members. Good evening, everyone. Excuse me first, my English is limited. Please allow me to talk slowly, and please give me a little bit more time. Uh, I will talk about TOPA. I oppose TOPA because it not only hurts the exist existing homeowners, but also has no any help with tenants. Even if tenant becomes homeowner, TOPA would essentially remove all the financial benefits and freedom of ownership and leave them with all the responsibility. How is that a worthwhile investment? Once the city forces the deed restriction on the property to make it permanently affordable, what is the property 
explain wars to you and others? Would a bank even grant a borrower a loan under this condition? Also, TOPA is completely unnecessary. There are no laws prohibiting any nonprofit organizations, government entity, or one or group of renters from making an offer to purchase any properties today. In contrast, they are welcome to operate in our supposedly free capitalist economy. Third, the failed result and the failed 40 years history of TOPA in Washington, D.C. revealed it had no help with our housing crisis. However, the higher administrative costs wasted a lot of taxpayers' money. Let me share my story. I am a new immigrant. Uh, I used to live in Kansas Avenue. I would not be able to buy my house in 2019 if TOPA was in place at that time. TOPA in favorite the so-called nonprofit organizations de deprives all other willing buyers' rights, including mine, to purchase the same property on the same term under TOPA, a third party organization which was not the tenant would have power to buy my house or more favorable terms than I could. I would have been shut off and all my buyers and all new buyers will be disadvantaged and deny fair access to the housing market. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Judy? you guys line up, please? Um, hi. Uh, uh, I think TOPA and the city, uh, citywide rent control are the biggest obstacles for Albany residents to build more housing, more unit, or even build more eight uh, housing like ADUs or multifamily homes. The uh, motivation for homeowners to build JADU, ADU, or multifamily homes is to help them to uh, get some rental income. But when the property uh, has one more unit, like a you build the ADU, you have two units, and the main house, the main house will be under rent control. And we already have statewide rent control. If we, uh, if city of Albany add TOPA or city and citywide rent control, it will even further and de demotivate people to build more housing, more units. And we are local mom and pop property owners. Uh, we are not not rich, like uh, rich people or corporate. Okay, and the Albany um, residents, we pay huge tax and uh, a huge mortgage and the property tax to maintain the homes and send our kids to Albany schools. And we try very hard and the expen ex expenses are getting higher. For example, the electricity bill, PG&E bill went doubled last month and the the uh, property tax keep on increasing, okay? So we have to, and I hope the city can consider us. We are trying very hard. And uh, all the expense add up. And then if the city add more constraints like a TOPA or rent control, and our life will become harder. And we will, like a couple of weeks ago, I went to a party and we were talking about People were talking about building more unit to help them to get a more passive income. And when we talk about, when I mentioned about a possible TOPA or citywide rental control, and people 
instantly lost the interest. Okay, this is how it will affect us. And we know that our goal is to create more housing for people. If we have less housing, and, and then we cannot provide uh, people and then the rent will increase more. So please consider eliminate, eliminate the toll pie and the rent control in our housing element. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Michael. Karen. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, good evening, City Council members. Kieran Chenoy, Director of Government Affairs with the Bridge Association of Realtors. Uh, the Bridge Association of Realtors is an organization that represents a diverse group of more than 2,000 realtors that live and do business in or immediately around Albany. We support sound and reasonable housing policy and candidates for elected office that support sound and reasonable housing pol policy. We applaud you, the City Council and staff, as well as the consultant for all the work in completing the housing element and taking the city one step closer to the goal of creating more housing units for those who need them. Unfortunately, we do not believe program 5D and especially 5E work towards that goal. In fact, we believe they run contrary to the housing element's stated po policy of zero net loss of rental housing stock. We are aware that a large percentage of Albany's rental housing cons stock consists of single family homes, duplexes and triplexes. Every day I interact with realtors uh, that tell me that their clients are wary of increasing regulation around their rentals and that they would like to sell before something like TOPA makes it on the books and complicates their ability to plan for their future. Even the hint that city council is considering such a policy could be enough to motivate many housing providers to sell single family homes, duplexes, triplexes for owner occupancy, thereby not only decreasing the rental stock in Albany, but displacing sitting tenants and working against your zero net law school. Lastly, as council member Hanson Romero noted, TOPA didn't make it on the vast majority of housing elements in immediately neighboring cities, including Berkeley. Please move the housing element forward without programs 5D and 5E. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Hi, my name is Don Calmoto, and I'm an Albany resident an Albany property owner, an Albany landlord, and also the aunt of a niece who was on Section 8 housing in another city. Um, I wanted to say that I am opposed against TOPA um, because for several reasons. One is I think it would hurt Albany's goal of increasing its housing base. I think people who are looking to build an ADU or two or three or four units on their property would be dissuaded to do so if they knew TOPA existed. And I would expect and hope that Albany would make that be very transparent and disclose that to any property owner who was thinking of building an ADU, two, three, or four units on the property that either TOPA is in place or TOPA is being considered before they spend the money to do additional housing units on their property. Um, what I would hope that the city would look at doing is using more of a carrot approach with property owners. And I think the planning department is already looking at that with looking at offering incentives to those who are looking at building ADUs by offering, you know, financial incentive for waiving some costs and other things if they provide affordable housing with their ADU. And I think that would be a much more uh, a better path to take is with the carrot approach. Uh, thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for your comment. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Josh Polston. And a quick background on myself. Um, I am, I think, the definition of a small kind of bootstrap housing provider. I, bought a four unit building that was bank owned. It was pretty much a wreck about 10 years ago and I've slowly been, you know, one toilet at a time kind of improving it, 
making it a little nicer and trying to improve the housing stock. And I listened to the presentation and read some of the materials. And what I came away with is that, you know, there's a focus on production, disincentives to build or reducing disincentives to build and reducing the cost and constraints of creating new housing. So let me just talk about um, these issues. Um, I have the perspective of I've been a renter. I'm currently a housing provider. And I also uh, have studied urban planning and, you know, so now kind of work in housing um, by way of, you know, my, my, uh, my work and my investments. So there really is no such thing as affordable housing here in the Bay Area, unfortunately. You know, units are $700 to $900 a square foot, which means that even a simple one-bedroom or two-bedroom apartment costs $600,000 to $800,000 to build. So you need the private market to build these for the residents. So what can we do to reduce costs and constraints? Well, what I would suggest you not do is create the kind of programs that you see in Berkeley and Oakland that add costs, that add uncertainty and add risk. You know, you look at the situation there and they don't have TOPA yet, but they do have these tenant protection items. And what it does is it creates risk and uncertainty and cost. And I think the ADU is the perfect example. Um, you know, I talk to a lot of folks that are interested in building ADUs, and I happen to know a little bit about it, maybe too much. And when I tell them that if they choose to build an ADU in a place like Berkeley or Oakland, that they will have a lifetime tenant. So, you know, there's lots of people that get married full of hope, but some marriages end in divorce. It's just a fact. And the same thing is with tenancies. You know, a tenancy that ends in an eviction is a failed tenancy. It's not a good thing. But there is a natural need to resolve issues when they happen. So if you're a homeowner and you're considering building an ADU and you're locked into a situation where you have a tenant with a lifetime lease, that is not a good situation. And that is not a situation I would recommend anyone ever build an ADU. So I think we have to be very careful about how we, once again, goal number four, reduce the costs and constraints and incentivize production. Because putting this whole host of measures that just create risk and cost do not do that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Hi, uh, this is Nick Pilch, Chair of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Speaking for myself right now, uh, I have more comments for later. I am a landlord, what some are calling a housing provider. Elsewhere, not in the city of Albany. However, I used to be a landlord in Albany. I appreciate the concerns of the other landlords, but in my mind, TOPA is an idea and can be implemented in any number of ways, including as a requirement, a stick, or as another uh, speaker pointed out, as a carrot. And that's what I would prefer is if we had economic incentives, I think that would be a better way to go. The element simply says that we'll study or consider this very general idea. Uh, and secondly, I look forward to more input from tenants. As HCD, Housing Community Development pointed out, uh, we need to be more proactive about reaching out to the tenants, especially as they are the more vulnerable of the population. And they've not been well represented in terms of the number of them involved in this process so far. And as I said, I have more comments for later, so I'll stop there. Thank you for your comment. Hello, this is uh, Jeremiah Garpinguello. I just have... Um, one question I'm kind of focusing on, I'm not sure if this is the right time to say it or not, but um, is the housing element, is this the process that's supposedly a, a 10 year plan? I know you mentioned either 2015 or 2017, and we're approaching 2023 right now. Um, so it could potentially be five years along in this. So my question is, um, Basically, how many housing units is Albany required to build in this 10-year 
span. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I thought the housing element was a 10-year process. I believe it was 1,000 units in 10 years. Is that how many we're supposed to build? I was just kind of wondering what we're on now, you know, including Saha and the um, Albany Bowl construction area, and how many more housing units do we need to build before this 10-year process is over? Um, so that's just my basic questions. I, I hope you understand what I'm saying. I'm just basically wondering, is this the 10-year process? Are we about halfway through it? Um, how many units have we completed and how many more do we need to uh, complete? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Jim? Yes. My name is Jim Acock. I'm a 40, almost 40 year resident and homeowner in, in Albany. And I support uh, renter protections, including TOPA. I see this as just one of many, of a many facet approach to making housing available to low income renters and increasing and maintaining diversity in Albany. Uh, over the years, I've seen uh, the diversity of Albany be continually reduced, and I don't want to see it become just a, a haven for wealthy and, and well-to-do people. I, I, I value diversity. I value the opportunity of many kinds of people to be able to have home, home ownership in Albany. I see TOPA as just uh, probably... Uh, not very often used because it is complicated and I do not understand how it is necessarily a threat to sellers. Uh, it provides, uh, it can provide that uh, what is offered to people, uh, to the homeowners has to be at market value and, and it, how it is implemented depends on how we choose to implement it, how, how we choose to structure it. So I hope that we will have it in our housing element and we'll all work together to make this uh, a, a usable uh, element of our efforts to provide housing to all people in Albany. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hello, thank you for taking the time to listen to Albany residents. Your patience and dedication are appreciated. I'm very nervous to speak, so I prepared a statement that I will read to you. I am a single mother. I live in Albany because it's a beautiful city. My kids will have the chance to grow up in a safe community and attend excellent schools. I work two jobs and drive for Uber if I ever have extra time. I am stretched beyond my budgeting limits because the cost of my housing is so high in proportion to the income I am able to make. My landlady can raise the rent anytime she wants. I was not told about any renter protections when I moved in. Instead, I was given the impression the landlady was doing me a favor by allowing my kind of low income family to live in Albany. I dread the first week of the month because there might be a letter in the mail telling me I am priced out and I feel that I have no recourse. I am doing my best, and I would like to think my city is doing the best for me. I repeat what is best, not just what is legally required. Please consider adopting any and all renter protections that would support variable income families like mine. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, I'd like to just make a comment on the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. Uh, TOPA, uh, this ten, so-called Tenant Opportunity is really a false promise to tenants that uh, tenants can purchase home, this home uh, through this amazing legislative way. 
but it's not really true when you look at the details and uh, and when you looked into it, it actually harms tenants. Um, in San Jose, they're saying that Topa and its cousin policy, Copa, would allow low income and extremely low income tenants uh, to be uh, to have a pathway to home ownership. But uh, when you dig into it, you say, well, what percentage of homes that are purchased through this program would result in a low and extremely low income tenant owning? And the the percentage is closer to 1% or zero is more, more likely. There's no more uh, mortgage loan qualification process for low income and extremely low income tenants to buy, but that's how it's sold in San Jose. So uh, I would suggest you just follow the money and look at what who benefits from this program. And what happens when you do that, you see limited affordable housing funds that are normally go directly to tenants in a form of low uh, uh, rental assistance for low income tenants and down payment assistance, which what tenants really need to become homeowners, you see that affordable housing funds, limited amount of public funding money gets diverted to TOPA and COPA developers. And these people actually de deliver housing very inefficiently and waste money away. So TOPA has been in Washington, D.C. for over 40 years and didn't spread across the country all this time because there are serious issues with it. And in the Bay Area, a number of cities have considered it. Richmond City Council unanimously halted TOPA in 2019 because they saw how harmful it would be. Berkeley proposed it in 2020. It went nowhere and it's not in the current housing element. Ask why East Palo Alto considered it in 2021, it didn't pass. San Jose, strong public opposition. There's a reason for it. In Berkeley, the, the COPA developers and TOPA developers are so inefficient that they have to increase rent on tenants and create capital improvement loopholes to jack up rent. A tenant that's paying $1,000 a month in rent would be paying $1,500 a month in rent. They want to remove just cost protections, property tax exemptions, all these horrible things. Look into the details. Don't fall for the Thank false Thank you for your promise. comment. Thank you. Derek. Hi, good evening, Hi, good evening City Council. Um, this is Derek Barnes. I'm the CEO of East Bay Rental Housing Association. Um, our organization has been around since 1939. We rep represent about 1,500 members across the counties of Alameda and Contra Costa County, including the beautiful city of Albany, where our, some of our owners own rental property. The majority of them are small owner operators. And I wanna just comment on TOPA specifically um, and, and really kind of focus on some of the unintended consequences and backfires uh, in implementing and in, 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 in enacting TOPA in Washington, D.C. specifically. Um, I've been a long resident of California for over 20 years, but I did live in Washington, D.C. In D.C., it increased housing costs due to higher prices and required a lot more administrative overhead and costs to build and maintain. It increased competition for rental units, which can lead to higher rents, which obviously harm renters and decrease the availability of affordable housing as owners may be less likely to rent to lower income tenants. It increased in evictions as new incoming owners may not be likely to evict uh, tenants in order to sell their rental units. And it's also linked to displacement of minorities in Washington DC at the time. Studies have found that TOPA has enabled wealthier, whiter tenants to purchase their rental units while lower income minority tenants have been unable to take advantage of the uh, of this uh, ordinance uh, due to the high cost of housing and, uh, and the lack of available financing. And this has resulted in the displacement of a lot of minorities in the communities of Washington, DC. Uh, tenants can also be exploited in a variety of, a variety of ways. Um, after a deal is closed, new rental owners or nonprofits raising rents or refusing to make necessary repairs actually drive tenants out. 
savvy new investors and well-funded nonprofits enter into targeted communities with uncapped promises. They try to take advantage of tenants by raising rents and re or refusing to make the necessary repairs. And all of this ultimately displaces um, communities that desperately need housing. In 2019, um, the DC City Council voted to repeal TOPA. The repeal of TOPA was part of a larger effort to make DC more uh, attractive to, develop, to developers and investors. As we heard earlier, Berkeley tried twice over the last few years um, to pass TOPA and failed to convince residents. In 2019, Richmond attempted to enact TOPA. The proposed ordinance was ultimately rejected by Richmond City Council. I urge you to reject the misguided promise of TOPA and all the reasons mentioned earlier. It's not a win for the city and for the longstanding Thank residents. you for your comment. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Jim Acock for his comments, which uh, very much uh, uh, are, are similar to mine. One thing I'd like to throw out first is that, uh, uh, which I've not heard in the discussion about TOPA, is about housing itself and about the power that people who own homes uh, have enough income to buy houses have uh, in our communities and in our country. And uh, I think we need to think about the people that are endeavoring to, to be able to own their own places to live as we think about TOPA. Um, and the thing that uh, caught my attention is that when I read about the TOPA Act, I thought there was some place where there was an act that would, had been set up by the federal government or some higher up level. Uh, but as far as I can tell, that's not the case. That uh, TOPA gets set up in each community that tries to do it. So why can't Albany take a stab at it? We could have it approved in the housing element. We could then get together with people who are renters, as well as property owners and other folks in the town that want to see housing expanded, and see if we can come up with a plan that would work uh, for all involved. Uh, we certainly have the opportunity to do that. And, uh, you know, I would like to see that maybe within a year or a year and a half, uh, we would come up with something that would work and, and benefit everybody, as opposed to uh, possibly some false situations coming from the property owners that uh, don't necessarily apply if you're doing it a case by case uh, uh, situation. And then I'd also just like to say beyond TOPA that uh, in terms of renter protections, I'm totally in favor of those. And again, these are the people that need to be able to get up in, in the world, along with the rest of us privileged people, especially here in Albany, that are able to afford the high price of housing. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Hi, um, I just have a question I'm going to start with and I'm hoping that somebody can answer it when I'm done. Um, so the question, my question is why are the number of housing vouchers going down? I, I didn't, I, that was news to me and I was just curious if somebody knows. And I also wanted to uh, um, hope that you understand that the reason that you're getting more comments from, from um, landlords is because they have a way of connecting with each other and it's much more difficult in Albany as a tenant to find other tenants. And as far as I can see, the city hasn't really made an effort to try to contact tenants um, to let them know about what's going on in terms of meetings like this tonight. I also want to ask Barry to please explain what TOPA is and isn't. Explain that the city defines it, that it's different in each city. Explain that it can be multiple unit buildings, such as four or even units, that there can be seller protections. And as Nick Pilch pointed out, it's an idea. The reactions of the TOPA and renter protection remind me of the reactions years ago when cities decided to integrate, to get rid of segregation. Same kind of stories. It was incredible. This, you could just take the, what's being said tonight and just put it right there. Property values will go down. No one will want to buy. This will harm the person who's talking. It's the same language, the same fears, the same misinformation. So I'm hoping that somebody can clarify what is the true information and we can get away from this fear-mongering that I, I, I am so sad to see. 
I want to um, go back to like many concerned, um, sorry, community members. I'm speaking tonight in favor of a housing element that respects, that supports the current and prospective renters of Albany, and that includes TOPA, which, as I said, is defined by each city and which is not a threat to landlords or to housing prices or to, to, to tenants or any of the other things that we've heard tonight. I also support a meaningful rent review process, or ideally, but probably not going to happen in Albany, rent stabilization. I want to live in an Albany that is supportive of all, that aspires to be inclusive, diverse community, economically, racially, culturally, ethnically diverse, a place where people who aren't rich can afford to live and own property and thrive, a place where we embrace our arena numbers and we don't try to lower them, a place where we keep everyone informed, including the many tenants who have no idea there are any tenant protections so the tenant protections are meaningful to the tenants. A place where city staff make sure that every renter knows about renter protection so they don't have to find out accidentally. Um, I can see I'm running out of time. A place where everyone, including every mom and pop, not just, not just those who are landlords, can find home without fear of having their rent raised or retribution if they complain about inadequate conditions and lack of repairs. We need to put our heart into this housing element because it is, is our heart that defines this city. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hi, <clears throat> this is Francesco Papalia again. And uh, I have lived and worked in Albany as a licensed real estate agent for 33 years. And I can state categorically that the number one predictor of values and costs of real estate value is the economic law of supply and demand. Proponents of rent control, just cause eviction and TOPA, remind me of climate change deniers. They do not want to acknowledge that, that the housing shortage has been caused by 30 plus years of public housing policies that inhibited the production of new housing, caused by nimbyism, caused by environmental groups that advocated for open space instead of housing. These policies suppress the production of supply that, have, could, that could have met the demand from people who wanted to live in Albany. Until of just a few years ago, density was a dirty word around the cities in the East Bay, even in Albany. Naming the housing providers and demonizing them as the problem and forcing them to carry the sole financial burden to remedy the housing shortage is very simple. It's unjust and unfair. If you want housing providers to, to be part of the solution to the housing shortage, then devise incentives that make it practical for them to do more for the benefit of all of Albany. Punish the housing providers. You should be thanking them for taking care of the housing for decades and rewarding them with your thanks and incentives, which parts of the housing element is doing, okay? But this punitive and demonization of housing providers um, actually, one of the recent speakers linked it to the racial desegregation argument, once again, denies that it's a shortage of supply that is driving the cost of housing up. And we should be, until this city and every other city increases the supply, the problem will exist. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. If I could have three people lined up in the room at a time, Peter Campbell, Greg Brazil, and Chris Moore. Hey, my name is Peter Campbell. Uh, thank you. 
Let me say I'm not opposed to tenant protections necessarily. Uh, I think all people should be protected. If we're going to protect tenants, I think we should pr protect the rental providers as well. So I would suggest that provider protection should be built into any regulations as well as tenant protections. Both, both sides are, are, are important. If you don't have providers, you don't have tenants. That's plain and simple fact. Um, under 5D, many of those points are covered under state law, and I don't think Albany needs to develop a new bureaucracy or anything to try to improve upon what the state has already d determined was be good for the uh, state as a whole. Uh, I think um, the state protections are, are adequate. One thing that hasn't been addressed this evening is the concept of fair choice. This, I believe, is a concept where somebody evaluating a prospective resident in, a, in their property would not be allowed to check on their eviction history. And I just can't understand that at all. Why would that be in there? I urge you to take that particular thing out. If you don't do nothing else in 5D, take that part out. Because how can somebody rent, to a, prop rent a property to somebody if they don't know they're going to get paid? If the person they're dealing with has a history of never paying rent or being evicted over and over again for non-payment of rent or for being a nuisance tenant or whatever, how in the world can you make a good choice if you can't consider that t type of information? So that's uh, an important point that hasn't been addressed yet this evening. As far as TOPA is concerned, I wanted to make a couple of comments on that, if I may. First of all, when the property gets sold, the tax base goes up. So what's that mean for the person who buys it? It's going to be more expensive. Now, uh, quite often, the property that a tenant lives in is rented for less than what the cost of the mortgage would be, what the cost of taxes would be, what the cost of insurance would be, what the cost of utilities would be. And so the TOPA doesn't solve anything. It makes it more difficult to, um, to get the property sold. And by the way, tenants have the right to put an offer in on a property when it gets put up for sale anyway. There's no reason for a special legislation or a special law to say, oh, you have the right to buy this property. They already have the right to make an offer on the property and buy it if they can. But please remember, if there were no rental providers, there would be no tenants. I think that's the underlying factor here. You need to be fair to everybody. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hello. Thank you uh, for letting me speak today. My name is Chris Moore. I'm on the board of the East Bay Rental Housing Association. Uh, you heard some comments from uh, Derek earlier. I sent this letter in to everybody. Um, this has a lot of detailed comments. It's a lot of, I, I focus a lot on policy in the Bay Area uh, with the city of Berkeley, city of Oakland, city of San Leandro, Alameda County, uh, up in Antioch, uh, and of course here as well. And I understand and provide housing and also mentor housing providers, mom and pop housing providers in these communities where there's rent control. And these rent regulations, and you can look at any study literally worldwide, they destroy the housing in the community because communities do not build housing quick enough to build new supply when they implement these type of controls and protections. Albany is one of the you know, if I, if I, for years, everybody wants to invest in Albany. Everybody wants to invest here. And it, it, if you would open up and allow people to create production, you would solve the tenant protection problems. You'd solve all those problems. You need to open it up and you need to build more housing. That is, that's, that's key. But things have changed. That's not the case actually in Berkeley and Oakland. People are afraid. How, small mom and pop housing providers are running away. They're selling. They want to get out. They're not building ADUs because more and more tenant protections come on and it drives up the cost of housing and they, they, it causes all, all kinds of problems. Um, so the Albany, Albany uh, uh, housing element just by putting these comments for TOPA, tenant protections, these other things, it's scaring away people. It's putting a pause as to, like, like people said before, I'm not gonna build an ADU if, who knows what's going to happen. So just putting these words in are, are a problem. 
And the other thing that you have, because we know what happens, we saw it at Alameda County the other night uh, with the Moms for Housing, which is a ten from a tenant advocate group, actually, they're, they're funded out of ACE, which makes money. The more regulations they can get in these city councils, the more money they make by getting funding and, and supposedly providing protection to the, to the renters and advice. You're going to have an entire room full of people from San Francisco and every other city that are, that are going to be lobbying whichever city council is in place when those, uh, activity, when those uh, protections and TOPA comes up, and they are going to put a lot of emotional pressure on the city council to vote for these these acts that are bad for the community. What you should do is go back to the red lines. You're hearing from housing providers. Housing providers understand what, how, how, uh, how to best provide housing, and they understand what regulations, how they are damaging to the community. And so, I, uh, again, ax topa and put the red lines back in that the housing providers uh, properly provided. Thanks for your time. Thank you for your comment. After Greg will be Matt Thomas and Margie Marks. Yeah, Greg Brazil, what he said. Uh, uh, I own two rental units in, uh, in town here that I've lived in both of them, and they're my retirement. And so if you, uh, if you enact this uh, TOPA thing, my two units are gonna be for sale the next day. They won't be in a rental market anymore, which I think it's very important. It's good money for you people. It's good money for us. Uh, uh, I think Topa is is so wrong. It's pathetic. It's putting too much government in in property owners' hands. And th during this whole conversation, I've heard one person talk about uh, rights of property owners. Nobody else is saying. All you people haven't said a word. Your 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 consultant hasn't said a word. Uh, you know, we need some uh, protections also. Uh, and I'd like to hear from your uh, your consultant why he thinks if TOPA is taken out of this thing, it won't pass the state. A lot of other cities are doing it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Matt Thomas or Margie, go ahead. I spent part of uh, my weekend uh, reaching out to renters. And one thing's really clear, they are afraid to speak up. So I'm here tonight to speak for them. California has asked for concrete, meaningful actions for non-displacement, tenant protections, and to affirmatively further fair housing. The state specifically says that cities need to go beyond just study or evaluate. Yet that is what the city is proposing for renters. An evaluation is not protection. An evaluation is just a delay tactic that will waste money, time, and energy. The city knows, number one, the rent review program is broken because the landlords are not following it, and only 17 cases were filed in five years with 4,000 renter households in Albany. Two, right now, tonight, not next month, not next year, tonight, as I speak, 2,000 Albany households are a danger of displacement, and many of them are our families of color. Does the city really want to study further the 70% of cost-burdened black families, or the 50% of cost-burdened Hispanic families, or the 45% of Asian households that are cost-burdened? Concrete and meaningful actions would include, one, put a local just cause for eviction ordinance on the city council agenda before the end of 2023. Put strong renter protections, including rent caps, on the city council agenda or on the ballot in 2024. Renter protections have passed in other cities and not by just a narrow margin in spite of how much money the landlords have spent on campaigns. As for TOPA, put some concrete and meaningful actions around it. On page A57 of the housing element under reduced displacement risk, the number one contributing factor is limited renter protection measures. On that same page, it says, quote, reducing displacement also is about creating opportunities for Albany renters to become Albany homeowners. I don't see any other place but Tope in here where, where the housing element allows renters to become homeowners. I have been told that an evaluation is necessary to determine 
why the rent review is failing and what improvements can be made. City of Albany, you already know why the program is falling, failing, and any tenant advocate could tell you how to improve it. Please tell me one piece of information that would help inform renter protections in Albany that the city would get from a study of renters. You already know more than half of them are cost burdened. You already know persons of colors are particularly adversely affected. We want to live in a place where we can all thrive. Please take action to protect the most vulnerable in our city. And I just want to say a couple of council members reached out to me. We don't necessarily agree, but I appreciate the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, Matt Thomas or David Hertzer? Good evening, council members. I'm David Hertzer. I have provided affordable housing in Albany now for over 50 years. My rents are below market. I have never evicted a tenant in 50 years. I am typical of the many small mom and pop apartment owners who provide affordable housing in Albany. I want to talk uh, about TOPA. TOPA gives a third party the right of first refusal to buy a property that is for sale. As a real estate attorney, I know that this right really screws up a sale because the buyer must wait many months or longer before the buyer even knows whether or not there will be a sale. So most buyers do not want to assume this risk. So the threat of TOPA as provided in Program 5E makes property values uh, less and it makes uh, ownership less desirable. So what will happen is investors will go to other markets where there is no TOPA. Now also the threat of TOPA will deter those interested in developing new units in Albany. Obtaining 1,114 new units by 2031 will be a huge challenge for you. So why set up roadblocks for developers who are going to be providing the 1,114 units? And why advertise that Albany is not housing provider friendly? So program 5E is a big deal for the housing community. Please delete it from the element. Remember, you can always consider TOBA at a later time if you want. Just do not compel the consideration of TOPA with a fixed timeline as provided in 5E. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. That's all. That's all. Oh, man. Um, hi, my name is Elaine Stelton, and um, I've heard several times tonight that the tenants were not notified. Um, I want you to please take note of the September 6th meeting, uh, Barry Miller was there and uh, Jeff Bond was there. And at that point, at one hour and 35 minutes in, Janelle Geary asked if the tenants were notified. And actually Barry responded that actually 24 or organizations were on his list of tenants and that they emailed tenants, 24 different organizations of tenants in Contra Costa and Alameda County to sort of make them aware of the, what, what was the contents of the housing element. And they got zero responses to those emails. So again, if you want to watch the meeting, September 6, one hour and 35 minutes in. They also said at this meeting that the Albany Tenants Union was notified, as was Albany Thrives Together. Unfortunately, we were not notified. We on the board of Albany Property Rights Advocates were never notified. We were not invite, invited at all to planning and zoning meetings. We are the only group that represents housing providers and nobody included us. It's extremely unfair. So I just want to point out one other thing. I know Margie Marks on many occasions has said 
that tenants are unaware of their rights under the law. All of us have to notify tenants of what the law is. I believe it's for AB 1482, is that correct, somebody? AB 1482, or we do not, we void the rental increase. So if we haven't notified the tenant, we do not get the rental increase. So we have a very strong incentive to notify tenants. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Uh, there are two questions from there that I think we can answer easily, uh, as well as one note and then a procedural note before we go into council discussion. Um, first, there was a question of how many units are required to build, what's the time frame, where are we in the process? I think I can answer this, but Jeff and Barry, correct me if I'm wrong. This is the start of the process. We have not started the next eight-year cycle yet. We are finishing up the fifth uh, cycle. This will be the sixth. It is eight years. Uh, this is our planning for the entirety of that cycle. We are assigned a uh, little more than 1,000 units to build in our pipeline currently. Um, so units that will be credited towards that, we have about 300. Um, but those, uh, importantly, those units do not match the uh, percentage of income that they need to be built in. So not, those units are mostly above moderate income, whereas we need to build uh, quite a number of affordable units. Did I get all of that right? I thought so. Um, there was another question which I have some speculation to, but I don't have an answer to offhand of why are the number of housing vouchers going down? Do we have any? sort of idea? Yeah, uh, it's declining federal funding for housing vouchers. That is what I figured. Um, there, also, we uh, heard from at least one tenant, and I wanted to note something that I've said in uh, any email that I've sent back to tenants who have uh, emailed the city council on this, which is, you know, even before we develop protections, if you are a tenant and you need some sort of assistance, or if you think something untoward is happening, please do get in touch with the city and the city council. There are resources available, both provided by the city and the county and the state that we can refer you to. So I do want that to be out there. Um, before we go to council discussion, I uh, just want to note procedurally here, we have to basically wrap up any discussion and action on tenant protections before our vice mayor comes back in from his relaxing break. Um, and uh, so we will have to discuss, you know, what we want to keep in or not. At the moment, everything that we're discussing is currently in the housing element. Uh, so how I'd like to do this is that if we'd like to take anything out, we can discuss that um, and vote on it if necessary. Um, but as it, as it currently stands, what's before us includes all the protections and TOPA, unless anyone would like to suggest we put anything in. Um, uh, but we can come to that when we get there. Um, with that, um, does anyone have any comments? I know I do, but I could talk all night about this and likely will, so I wanted to let everyone else go first if you want. Um, so yeah, in, in searching around the web regarding uh, TOPA and its other acronyms, it does seem like it's crafted city by city. Um, how many, do you know how many cities actually have such a program currently? No, I don't have that information. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, I only ran across, I think, San Francisco that has had one running in the Bay Area, but I can't say as I ran into a thorough index on that. Um, so I guess, I mean, I have a lot of questions, but I guess all those questions could be answered should the body end up considering TOPA, like, if there's a property with a uh, primary residence and an ADU, and the primary residence is owner occupied and the ADU is rented, is that property subject to TOPA? And I guess that would depend upon this council's decision. So it could be anything we want, essentially, or anything this, this body agrees on. Um, which goes to one of my concerns, which is that it's a, it's a lot of policy development because there isn't just a template out there and it's a lot of policy development for a small city and a small city staff for what will likely be not much utilization. Um, in my search I ran into in, in San Francisco in the last few years, it looked like it had been utilized twice. Uh, 
I wish I could have found a better index on that, but that was the, the information that I found, which if it's only being utilized that infrequently in San Francisco, I really question putting um, a lot of effort into developing this policy in Albany as the best use of city staff time for making a difference. Um, I guess I also don't know if TOPA is usually restricted to um, people who rent who have a low income, in which case it is confusing to me how they would be able to, to buy a residence. So uh, those, are, those are some thoughts. Curious to hear what other people say. Um, I, I think you are getting at an important thing here. Of it's, it's up to us to figure out how it would work. And we've heard a lot about possible pitfalls. The, you know, the goal of any process we would go through as a city in considering anything we do is to avoid those pitfalls, take in information, take in best practices, and design a program that we think works. And if, you know, if at the end of discussing it, we find that it won't work for us, that's one thing, but to say there are all these possible problems in it ignores that you know we will, just by what we put in here, we will be looking at it to design it in a way that works for Albany and does not create those issues. I'll point out that for pretty much all tenant uh, protections, one of the things we've heard about a lot is you know how will this affect ADU development or smaller uh, projects. Uh, almost every tenant protection um, to some extent, exempt smaller properties, ADUs, uh, single family homes, things like that. Um, that is pretty much the consistent best practice as I understand it. Um, so I don't think that it, you know, I don't think there's a, a convincing reason to me why we would go against that for a lot of these things, probably including TOPA. Um, I would also say for making it work, the best practice, you know, policy advice on this from some of my coworkers is you know, pro programs often don't necessarily work on their own. They do work better when you have some form of funding to make it more possible for uh, units to be bought either by nonprofits or tenants. Um, so if we just went with TOPA, it might not work it, 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 without funding. I think it's probably still worth exploring it will work better if we then consider, well, is this something that needs funding to work, and is that a, a priority we'd like to also develop? And nothing in here prevents us from doing that. Again, this, the housing element establishes a, a bar of what we have to do, and the state will come down on us hard if we don't you know, do some of that, but it doesn't preclude us from going above and beyond. So uh, just as a reminder of uh, when we were talking earlier, um, TOPA is not required to be in there. And it doesn't mean that it couldn't be something that would be discussed later on. Um, I'm of the thought process of you know trying to keep things as simple as possible to get this implemented and get it done with. And um, therefore, I, I don't see really the need to keep that in there at this time. Um, and also, you know, to review some of the stuff, Barry, if you could tell me a little bit more regarding 5D. Earlier you had mentioned that you would think that the state would have a problem if we removed 5D, but they would not have a problem if we removed 5E. Right, and that doesn't mean you can't edit 5D. I think it you removed 5E outright. We've seen other cities do that. Berkeley did that, for example, from the initial draft that they prepared. Mm -hmm. um, as long as there is language that addresses the tenant needs and anti, that has anti-displacement language. So that's what 5D is intended to do. It's your anti-displacement program. And it's broad the way it's worded now. It, it addresses a whole list of um, just cause and uh, looking at rent caps and things, implementing AB 1482, informing tenants of their rights and so forth. Um, so there's, it's a, it's a broader program. So to delete that whole thing just mm -hmm. would, I think, raise a red flag for the state. I don't think that that is the case with TOPA, given that it is not widely used in the Bay Area right now. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's relatively untested. 
Um, I mean, that, and that's the reason that we kept it as a pretty conditional program that says you're going to study the feasibility. You could study the feasibility and decide you don't want to do it. Um, but that's, you know, an action to, that would happen in the future. Thank you. And I will say, you know, as, as a real estate agent myself, uh, when I have clients shopping in certain areas, that is a huge red flag to them. That is something that they were like, oh, never mind, don't want to buy there. Again, a lot of places with rental restrictions and stuff like that, again, that's a huge red flag for especially people who are just, you know, trying to, you know, make some sort of a retirement plan for themselves. And I've seen firsthand an issue um, that we had, uh, you know, even, you know, the state has the programs as well as well as, um, you know, with COVID and the uh, protection, and I'm not saying that people shouldn't deserve the right to be protected and things. I'm a renter myself right now. So I understand firsthand how that could, you know, be different, but sometimes, you know, people have a reason that they have to sell. Um, but during the COVID protection times, we had somebody who purchased a unit um, at the Gateview building um, just not long before COVID hit and then rented it out to a person who, as soon as that protection happened, stopped paying rent and hasn't paid rent since. And they've tried to get rid of that unit on the market a couple of times at a very, very low cost, but nobody wants to take it over. Because, again, if you're... At, and, again, some of the people who were saying... Um, you know, they may have bought the property a long time ago. It's paid off. They're able to keep the, the rents low. In a TOPA program, say, for example, my, my property provider decides, okay, we're going to go through this TOPA program, and, okay, well, bam, here's how much you, you can buy the property for. I'm not necessarily going to be able to afford that property. I'm paying a lowered amount of rent. Another thing that was brought up also um, by another rental provider is that um, if they're forced to maintain certain restrictions, they're going to continue to increase that rent as quickly and as often as they can, which causes things to be that much less affordable to everyone. So I just want to point that out and just, you know, in discussion so that we think about that in, in the forefront of this. So. Um, I'll just say this is this is new to me because this is uh, I think it's those rare moment where we are expressing disagreement uh, for once. <laughs> uh, kind of like it, but I don't like it. But it shows that like we we are we are human and we can have the dialogue, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, the only point I'll make right now is that. Um, Having the existing language that we have right now in the housing element doesn't, to my understanding, does not marry us to any specific action. It does, however, though, uh, place accountability on us as elected leaders to do our due diligence down the road, to think of creative solutions. That's why I asked that question earlier. Uh, can we think of other creative solutions? Well, as long as we have language in there that uh, shows that we can hold ourselves accountable, whether it's TOBA program or not, um, it's in there for us to explore. And it's not a novel concept for uh, local government, uh, local cities or municipalities to expand further on existing state laws and programs. Um, well, I'm... I do get a bit put off when I hear rhetoric like that. And, uh, you know, not every law and every existing program is necessarily beneficial for folks or necessarily uh, equitable across the board, across race, gender, and uh, socioeconomic status or any other intersectional uh, practice around that. Um, right now, I'm on the other side of the fence where I, 
I'm content with the language as is. I wouldn't say I'm uh, super stoked or super excited with the language itself, um, but I'm content with what it is right now because it puts accountability on myself and all of us to do what we need to do to make well-reasoned, uh, logical, and well substantiated decisions around anything that involves uh, anti-displacement measures and beyond. Um, and I guess I'll just close out my uh, winded statement with also just saying this is really an opportunity for us to come together as a council and work collaboratively with city staff in the very near future with creative solutions. Uh, we are a small enough city where maybe something novel could actually work. What that is, I don't know. Um, but we could mess around and find out. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I think there's room for a lot of opportunity uh, with the language as is. Um, as you heard, it, it's broad enough that it gives us a lot of leverage to uh, go out into different avenues. Um, and I'll, I know I said I was going to close it out in my statement, but uh, one other thing on my mind is uh, we do need to submit a uh, solid housing element to the state for approval like yesterday. Uh, and the last thing I want the city to deal with is uh, any potential uh, financial fallout due to potential lawsuits because uh, feats are getting dragged here over language when we could work on issues and not uh, get so dug up on language that doesn't actually commit to any particular action. Um, I'll disagree, but only on the point that I am super stoked on this language because it's my day job to read the 16-page ACD letters that Barry referenced earlier from cities that don't do as good a job. And so uh, I think it's important to recognize relatively this is, this is very strong language as housing elements go um, with, with what we, we are committing to. Um, and it represents a real, realistic, actionable commitment to doing what we should be doing. Um, other than that, I, I completely agree. Um, I'll, I'll reference some other things of, you know, I, they, I think there is this argument that we heard in public comment and, and um, that has been referenced of, it's, it's unattractive to have some of these policies and it wards off some investment. I, I think there may be real reasons for that, but part of what I hear there is that people are attracted to investing in areas that are under-regulated. And I don't personally think it's acceptable for all need to be attractive for investment in housing because it's under-regulated. That's not why we want our, our city to be attractive, because you can you know, be here without having any of these things being active that I think should be active, um, that I think need to be, because and, uh, and I said this when we last discussed the housing element quite at length. Um, I'm hoping we don't go quite as late. Um, but, you know, these protections are really very necessary because there is and forever will be a huge power imbalance here of some people need housing and some people have the resources to own housing and rent it out. And on one side are people's investments and on the other side are people's basic needs to be housed. Um, and that will forever favor the people who have those resources and not the people who need the place to live. So I view tenant protections as a way to balance that out. And, it, and it's been referenced by uh, some commenters of, you know, we should take into account housing providers as well. I agree, we should take into account everybody involved in this situation. But we're talking about protecting one side of this equation because it is underprotected in the way the market exists right now. Um, and because how it is set up right now, it is not an equal playing field. Um, and I think that's why it's so important that we have a lot of these. Um, I, I, to address another argument that I've, I've heard uh, in, in many different contexts, not just in Albany, of you know, that this will har harm, that tenant protecting measures harm housing production um, 
I think viewed in a vacuum, they might. There would be some, you know, there, there's research that shows that there would be some small negative effect by having more housing controls and tenant protections. But we can't view it in a vacuum. We, this housing element has some programs that are tenant protections, and those are very, very important programs. But it's got a whole heap of other uh, programs that are housing production focused, that are trying to make it easier to produce housing, which is a really important thing we need to do. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out here that uh, as identified in the housing element, we are already an attractive place to develop just on its face. Our fees are lower for developing housing and building than any of the cities around us. Uh, at, at least I believe that's what the housing element said about our fee schedule. Um, so it's not that we are against housing production trying to make ourselves unattractive. And we also have to realize that you know, the context also includes that it's the Bay Area housing market. It will forever be profitable to own housing. Uh, the rents are higher than they are anywhere else. The value you can get from a home that you are selling is higher than pretty much anywhere else. So if we were in a vacuum, maybe these tenant protections would be decreasing the amount of housing production. But it's not an either or. And the housing element is very clear that it's not an either or. That's why the state requires us to do both. It requires us to do production, which I think more than balances out any negative impact we would have by having more tenant protections. Uh, the statement that Albany is a, a desirable place to, to invest and to build um, is belied, I would say, by the lack of residential construction that's occurred historically. Uh, I mean, we see lots of construction in El Cerrito and lots of construction in Berkeley and not here. So it, interestingly, uh, I don't know what to make of that, but it's, it's not an obvious correlation, um, let alone causation. Besides the, the, my concern about spending a lot of time on TOPA for m benefiting maybe a few households over the eight years, and, and yeah, also back up to, to clarify, I believe we're in those eight years now. I think it started January 1st. Is that correct? Okay, so 31st, okay, so, so we're, we're already into it. Because um, we're, we're late, yeah. So, you know, of all the different policies we could look at in terms of benefit, how many households they would benefit, it seems that we're, we're at risk of having this making commitments to OPA that we have to spend a lot of time crafting something that is not really available even half off the shelf, I would say, for a city like Albany. And when we're doing that, we're not going to be crafting policies that can benefit a larger suite of tenants. Um, philosophically, and we've been through this before, uh, last September. <clears throat> um, I also think it is, it is wrong to burden specific property owners for the problems that our entire society, civilization in the Bay Area and in California has created over the last 30 years by um, creating, well, passing Measure D, for instance, in Albany, which made it much harder to, to build because of the parking requirements. And so we're going to visit the correction of the sins of the past on very you know, particular and specific property owners, which I don't think is okay. Um, a friend of mine said, you know, it's, it's confusing that if as, as a society, if we think there's a problem here that we don't solve it collectively by having a stronger voucher program. And, and I agree. I mean, in the many initiatives that I've led in Albany, I've tried to collectivize the solution, like with, with sidewalk repair. You know, we did sidewalk repair um, adjacent property by adjacent property, and that, that was sort of a similar situation. And I said, you know, the solution is to collect, collectivize it. We, it's, a, it's a benefit to all of us, so we should all pay for it. Um, so I would like to propose putting into 5D as an item a local voucher program um, and remove 5E so that we look at it as something we all created this problem and we're all responsible for paying to the extent that we can to, to fix it, rather than trying to offload it onto specific property owners. And um, I know that we're time sensitive on stuff, but one of the questions that I had asked earlier, and um, you know, Jeff, if you could just 
jump in here for me is that we can make very small changes, edits, and still submit this after tonight if they're very might. As, as long as we can, you don't need to see it again is, yeah. is essentially the, the criteria here. If we can make those edits, get it posted tomorrow, the seven days, where you'd start to experience a real delay is if you wanted to review the draft after this evening, and then that's going to probably cost us a month or more. As much as I enjoy talking about these things, I don't think we need to see it after this evening. <laughs> um, I, unsurprisingly, I would oppose taking out 5E. Um, I'm not opposed to adding anything to 5D, um, uh, though I wouldn't want to lose anything from it. Um, and, you know, I agree we should be collectively financing housing. I think it's, it's not a either or, though. Um, Again, we discussed this at length uh, last time in September. Um, uh, you know, I, if we want to add that in, I would really love to submit this tomorrow, but if we really want to add that in, put it for a seven day period and then submit it, I could be at peace with that, but I personally don't want to take out 5E. Yeah, I would say I'm agreeable to the addition. Um, I think I'm, I'm, on the, I'm rocking on the same boat as Aaron right now. Um, I also like that you had proposed that because it's an opportunity for this city to reckon with its racist past of redlining and historical exclusion that has happened long before many of us were here. Um, but still exist in its residuals uh, today. Um, and we don't need to dive into that conversation right now, but uh, I just want to acknowledge that that's a really dope uh, idea that you just put on the table, and I really appreciate that. And how, how would that uh, work, per se, the adding a voucher? I can maybe. <laughs> I can offer a, which okay. is which is that it would be a bullet under 5D. So but 5D has But is that has a something number. that's possible? Is what I'm asking, because <laughs> I don't know that that is actually something that's possible. Okay, sure. So. That would be a threshold question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Wouldn't it be? You're, you're putting something that's going to be evaluated. So we don't know if it's possible or not. Yeah. I think that's why you're evaluating it. Uh, at this point, I'm not aware of any lo other cities the size of Albany that have local voucher programs. Yeah, so. it, it would be different than the voucher program that we're familiar with because that voucher program moves with the person from city to city. So it would be something that would obviously wouldn't move. We'd have to do some research on that, but that's what we're here for. It's, it's your, your direction to us to tell us what to work on. And um, I'm still, still of the notion of removing 5E. I feel like enough cities have looked at this plenty of times. I don't think it, we don't have the manpower, like you said, the staff, all the, and I just, I think it would prohibit the real building that we need to have happen here. We, you know, it was said before, supply and demand, the more we can increase the supply with the less restrictions and the more incentives, the better off we are all around. It's going to make things, if I have only two properties to show you and I have 10 people for that same rental unit, you know, it, as opposed to having 15 or 20 rental units and only three people applying, they have more choices. And I want to focus on just really the production and getting more units here in Albany rather than finding reasons for different people to say no to us. If I may just offer a couple, real quick observation um, with respect to the time frame that's in the draft as, as you have it at the moment. Um, the timing for the tenant protections is, is right away, the end of 2023, which means we're going to start working on it right away. The timing for the TOPA program, 5E, 
is by the end of 2025. So there's, there's a prioritization impl implied in that. Um, uh, so just, you know, over the passage of a couple of years, maybe there are other opportunities, there, there will be uh, uh, other cities that implement TOPA successfully or unsuccessfully that we can model from and, and maybe by 2025 it's 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 an easier task easier lift to research thank you speculating but yes yeah. thank you for pointing that out and uh, it is worth noting that, as you just pointed out we have some pretty aggressive timelines for the development of a lot of these things again just a, a note based on experience with other cities it is quite impressive to have these timelines and to uh, have them included sort of from the get-go, um, and I very much appreciate it. Yeah, and so in that regard, I'll, I'll harken back to our, our study session on the um, potential mandatory seismic retrofit program. Um, as I relay, that came up five years ago. There's a lot of people that live in those buildings that, and I'm not making this up, I mean, there's there's, studies from the USGS and ABEG out there could be dead now because of that five-year delay. Um, so the city really does have a specific bandwidth. And so again, I just don't see that, that TOPA is going to deliver the kind of benefit relative to the cost and staff time and our time that other things that we could pursue would. So. And, and I've, you know, I've been doing work in the city for 25 years and I've seen I, uh, as I t tell other advocates, I was an advocate before I was on council, the median time to get something done was seven years. Um, now, if we pass this, we're sort of short-circuiting all that and putting this ahead of anything else that could exist, traffic safety or anything else is gonna come first because we're making a commitment. So in a sense, we're making a strategic plan decision tonight. That is true to some extent, though I would point out that, you know, not everything we do has the same staff, um, and also we are staffing up our community development department, um, our planning department. Um, so it's not just Jeff. Um, <laughs> though we appreciate him deeply, and he's very hardworking. Um, so, you know, we're not necessarily saying this takes precedence over everything else. Um, we're saying that, you know, we have a timeline for the things we want to happen as they relate to housing, and I think that's what the planning department would, a lot of it would be working on regardless. Um, to get to some procedure here, um, because we have a whole other everything else in this housing element to discuss. <laughs> um, and uh, Vice Mayor, who's waiting very patiently outside, I'm sure he's enjoying himself. Um, you know, because there are four of us, and there are, there's, it's, you know, we've got, uh, a respectful disagreement. Um, I, it's hard to say how to go forward. My thought and how I tried to phrase it of what I, how I think this would ideally work under a interpretation of how Robert's rules are meant to work is the proposal we have in front of us includes all of these things. Um, we seem to have agreement on adding one or two. Um, we do not seem to have agreement, uh, and with counting, you know, where we're each at, on taking out 5E. Um, so by, by my read of the situation, we, we don't have the, unless someone changes their vote, we don't have the, the votes to essentially do a motion and take it out. Um, that's, that's my read of the situation. Um, as it stands. And I think uh, that's germane to take into account because apparently with the vice mayor situation, this is the situation that's going to exist at least for another two years. Um, now, it won't, there's going to be an election before the end of 2025, so maybe this uh, deadlock will not exist at that time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, note to people who might think about running for office. <laughs> this will be on your docket. This could be a reason. <laughs> if you've ever thought about it. Um, <laughs> well, in the, 
in the interest. Yeah. Seems like we need a fifth council person. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, I know how this is going to go, but in the interest of putting it on the record, um, I will move the approval. And I can't remember what resolution it is right now. I apologize, but not, not, we're not doing the resolution. We're just oh, we're doing, doing what right, we'd okay. like to do okay. on okay. tenant protection. So it'd be what you okay. Like tenant protection. Right. Thank you. Um, so I will move approval of all the tenant protection programs, with the addition of uh, consideration of a lo local voucher program to Program 5D and the removal of Program 5E. And you said the removal of 5E. So I, I would second that. I would hope. <laughs> Mullen, can I confirm, is that the right wording? Is approval right? Should we say adding to the housing element? Or I just want to make sure we're doing everything. This is weird. Y yes, it is a little odd. And, and this, what, what decision you make, I don't know what will happen with this vote. So we're clear, will be final such that it'll be incorporated uh, into your resolution that you adopt in the housing element, hopefully tonight. Um, but I think I think that's accurate because this part of the housing element will stay um, final. So then, when you go to the second prong and you talk about the next steps, that that'll be what you're revising for potentially for the resolution. Great, thank you, <laughs> City Clerk. We have a motion and a second. Would you please call the roll? Uh, Councilmember Lopez. Council Lopez. Yes. Might want to say no. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. <laughs> to be clear, what we're voting on this is removal of 5E as well as. Yeah, I'd hate to. As well that. as the additions. Yes. <laughs> so you want to, re I want to re restate the, the motion? Restate the motion, yeah. So let me do that. Um, so the motion is to approve um, all the tenant protections as proposed, to add consideration of local voucher program to program 5D, and to remove program 5E. So I didn't want to. I didn't, I didn't want to catch you out, man. <laughs> Don't do those sorts of tricks on this council. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, Mayor Tiedemann. No. Councilmember Hanson Romero. Yes. And Councilmember Jordan. Yes. Motion fails. So now it goes to your side, or, so now or you. <laughs> well, now, now they can, you know. Uh, well, then I'd say, then I move that we prove the tenant protection uh, piece of the housing element as written with your addition of uh, to 5D. A second. Council member Hanson Romero? No. Councilmember Jordan. <laughs> yes. Councilmember Lopez. Yes. Mayor Tiedemann. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. If I could just say a word. Please. Um, risking not turning something into the state at this point, I estimate the consequences would be far worse. So, but we have shown that we're tied on this. So, you win this round. <laughs> we'll see what happens with the next rounds. <laughs> and, and as I said last time um, in September, you know, this is a, an eight year plan. This is the start of a long process to figure a lot of these questions out. It is not the end. We have not. You know, we have not passed any of these policies tonight, where, where we haven't passed anything yet, but we will not, have, at the end of the night, have really passed these policies in a substantiated form that they're going to be enforced in Albany starting tomorrow. That's not how the process works. And anybody's input on this will be valued going forward as we will need it to actually develop all these policies and do the actual, you know, action of doing, of the hard work that's ahead of us. Um, so I know for some it's a frustratingly slow process, but we are still at the beginning of the process. With that, I think we've settled the question of tenant protections, so we can 
then have Vice Mayor Mickey come back, though I'm going to suggest that we take a five minute bio break. Yes, um, so we are on a five minute recess. We will be back at 10.16.
All right, um, we are returning from recess, um, and we are now taking up the rest of this item to discuss the rest of the housing element. Uh, we are going to go straight into continuing, continuing the public hearing, um, uh, and we are going to hear public comments uh, on the rest of the housing element. And to be very clear, this is not on tenant protections, so if you start talking about tenant protections, I will be forced to cut you off as because we are now joined by our vice mayor, we can no longer discuss them. Um, so please keep your comments to just the other portions of the housing element. Um, and yeah. Um, public comment. One of the issues that I ran across as I was visiting tenants, sorry, as I was walking around Albany, that there's a lot of issues, a lot of sa safety and health issues with mold and lead paint. And we actually had a mother who came to one of our last ATT meetings about her son that lives in a building with lead paint. She checked with the city and they said they, they don't have enough people to come out and enforce the law that is in, in the books. So I'm just glad that you're beefing up the department and I'd like to see a lot more code enforcement. I think it would really add to the health and safety of our citizens in Albany. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I'd like to uh, echo the comments by uh, the council person who talked about the collective responsibility that many of these issues entail. I mean, when you think about housing, housing cuts across all through society. And, you know, while the council took actions to exclude the vice mayor from the conversation, I think that was fundamentally unfair because everyone is either an owner, a renter, or a housing provider. And to, I think, single out the vice mayor was fundamentally unfair because personally, as a citizen, I'd like to know what our fifth elected official thinks about these issues. That's it. Just wanted to make that point. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Vice Mayor, do you want to respond to that very briefly? I, I would like to clarify that it was not a decision by the council that I recuse myself. It was decision I made based on state law. State law that very clearly states that I could not and should not participate in any discussion. I had, and had I participated in any way, any decision made by this council could in effect be negated, in which case the entire session would have to be redone and potential financial implications both on myself and on the city uh, could have been imposed. So uh, I want to clarify this was not a decision by the council. This was a decision by myself and not one that I took lightly. Thank you very much. Next comment. Nick, are you there? Greetings, Council. It's finally facing you after eight years of being up there. Um, <laughs> so I'm here and I want to go last because even before when this room was full of people, I looked around and as far as I know, there's only three people in the room who were here for the fourth cycle, the fifth cycle, and the sixth cycle. And that's Barry and Jeff and myself. So I've seen these guys work now for many years. And I want to let you know, we've been very lucky. Um, so I'm here to, to say to Barry and Jeff, thank you so much for your work over the years. It's, um, it's really hard, and I know it's getting harder. And I, you know, I certainly appreciate you. Um, thank you for your patience and your diligence. And I wanted to say this now because I don't think that the three of us are going to be around for the seventh cycle. 
Uh, I hope not. But um, and the, you know, the pro I was thinking of how to frame this, and I was thinking, you know, the TV show Parks and Rec. I think if they did an episode that actually realistically incorporated Rena into the show, all the audience would, members would be go, oh no, that's too dark, that's so unrealistic, that could never happen. But you know, you can't make this stuff up. So I know the sixth sixth cycle was especially difficult. But to summarize, you know, I now work, work with a lot of other local electeds across the state, and everybody's banging their head against the wall on this Rena cycle. But Many of them are also struggling with their advisors. And I just want, you, want to let you all know we got very lucky to have Barry all these years and to have Jeff. And that's pretty much I wanted, what I wanted to say. Just thanks a lot. Um, I don't know what we would have done without you all these years. So that's it. Thank you for your comment. Thank you, Michael. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, thank you. Sorry, I was double muted previously. Uh, I, I do also want to thank Jeff and say that we did uh, luck out and get a great consultant. Uh, this is Nick Pilch, Chair of the Planning and Zoning Commission. I don't know what changes the staff has made since the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Haven't had a chance to study those changes. I will note that the Planning and Zoning Commission approved it unanimously with one abstention from the near newest member who had only participated in, in one meeting so far. The rest of what I'll say will be my own opinion. I support the element with one change that the Commission added on, uh, and uh, you should ask staff to uh, elaborate that. I also made the following comments. Uh, I hope that we've done enough for affirmatively furthering fair housing, AFFH, including making sure that we talk about reforming uh, R1 zoning to include triplexes and fourplexes, and we have strong enough language for that. Um, and uh, okay, the rest of my comments were made earlier. So finally, a note about programs, as one of the council members has mentioned, there are we do have limited staff time, and there's a number of com programs we have committed to now. Uh, we, our commitment language is much stronger, and we're a small city. I think we need to make sure that we are both well-staffed to handle these programs, and that we prioritize these programs if we think we're not, not able to meet our deadlines, and we make sure that uh, we are realistic about what we can do. Um, Otherwise, I, I thank you for your work tonight. That's it. Thank you for your comment. Good evening. This is Francesco Papali again. Um, I heard and I noted that the affordable units that are going to be built at UC Village, plus the ones in the past, will not be able to be used as part of our uh, affordable units and part of our production that we get credit for. Everyone on the council should be outraged about that and be ready to go for the state and defend all of us in the city on this matter. And I'll explain to you why. People who live at UC Village do not pay taxes and the city and the university does not pay taxes. They don't pay taxes to support the schools. They don't pay taxes to support the parks or the waterfront. When all the new bonds that we put to build the new schools, they're not putting it forward to that. They're not, there, they're not paying the bonds for the libraries. And I want you to take a moment and look around to where you are. The new facility that you're in that was seismically retrofitted with solar panels on it and the fire department and the police department, it's all being paid for a bond by people like me and the property owners of Albany. And yet now we can't include, we pay for all of those services that the university provides and, and doesn't have to pay a dime. If you don't stand up to the city, to the state and find, I'm Jeff and Barry, I want to, I'm going to, I want to talk to you later this week, the next time I see you, and I want to know, know who specifically at the state level says that we cannot use those as part of our housing allotment. 
I want to know who the person is and identify him so we can find out what his reasoning is because maybe he doesn't understand that the city and every, that the that the that the university doesn't pay for any of the services that I just listed. All of the other taxpayers of Albany are are providing those services, so we should get credit for every single affordable unit and below market housing unit that the university provides. Those are the numbers, those are the facts, and if anyone has anything that refutes that what I said, please contact me personally. And I'm going to be talk, contacting everyone on the city council about this if you don't actually take action. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you for your comment. Uh, before we take more, yeah. I think we need a motion to extend our time. Okay. Uh, so we'll come back. To, I will come in a second. Second. Uh, sorry, was there a motion? Okay. Yeah, I was like, wait, what? In a specific time and what we're going to yeah, yeah. uh, Extend to um, uh, 10.50. Going once. And that would include, are you including 10.1 or just finishing this item out? Um, I'm including 10.1. I'm ambitious. We'll see. We can always make another motion. <laughs> no, <again>. All right, <laughs> I'll second. Um, and can we please have a quick roll call? Vice Mayor Mickey? Yes. Mayor Tiedemann? Yes. Councilmember Hanson Romero? Yes. Councilmember Jordan? Yes. Councilmember Lopez? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. And thank you for your patience, commenter. Let's go back to public comment. Oh, Mayor Tiedemann, uh, you know, actually, I, this public comment is actually to thank you. And um, I have an infinite amount of patience, um, it lasts forever. You know, I just want to thank you for answering my questions this evening. Uh, you don't know how much that means to me, but it really means a lot. There were 15, 20 public comments tonight, and you answered, you know, you answered my question. Personally, that, that really means a lot to me. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. it makes me feel really included. Um, it makes me feel like, you know, this democracy is working and it makes me feel that you guys are actually listening. And um, I have a newfound respect uh, for you, Mayor Tiedemann. Um, and also with that, not to go too much backwards, but um, so I guess we're starting the sixth um, term or the, we're starting over. Um, my question is, did we finish our housing element for the last one? I mean, did we reach our goal of building, you know, a thousand units um, or did we fall short? So I was just wondering, you don't have to answer now, maybe later, um, we may not have the answers tonight at the moment, but I was just curious, uh, the last round, uh, number five, I guess, uh, what was our progress? Um, were we 50%, 75%, you know, do we get, 500 out of the thousand it would just be kind of nice to know where we stood or where we stand that way maybe in the future we could um not work harder but just work in a better way maybe uh that way we reach our goal or the state's goal because it's set by the state right um but yeah so just two things i just want to say thank you very much for answering my questions it means a lot to me i i'm gonna sleep really good tonight and um also, where did we stand last time in round number five? Did we reach our goal or, or how close did we come? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, hi, my name is Brian Martin. Uh, I'm a resident on the 600 block of Adams Street. Uh, the city needs more housing, particularly more affordable housing. There are many benefits of high density developments to society, the local economy, the environment, public health, et cetera. There are also, unfortunately, negative impacts focused on neighborhoods of each of these dense developments. Um, part of the job of the housing element is to identify opportunity sites for dense housing. One of the newly identified sites at 618 San Pablo Avenue is literally in my backyard and stretches across the backyards of several of my neighbors. 
by right, a developer could build there nine, uh, at that location, nine stories high, almost straight up with zero car parking spaces, effectively blackening out the sun for half the day, turning our backyard and, and back windows into a fishbowl situation with hundreds of bedroom windows facing off against each other and all the impacts to local traffic and street parking that come from hundreds of new neighbors with nowhere to park. Uh, in contrast, at Albany planning and zoning meetings, when there is an R1 single family home on the agenda, uh, there are often 30 minute debates on the placement of a single window or a second story addition, or even a slight, just slight changes in a roof line or the removal of one single parking space that would otherwise be required for a particular remodel. Today, the city requires each of these changes to go before the Planning and Zoning Commission for approval. I do recognize that a significant portion of Albany's housing quota should be planned along San Pablo Avenue, but the housing element is not equitable, does not affirmatively further fair housing because it fails to spread negative impacts to other parts of town. An equitable plan would include the following, which the city should vigorously pursue, even if the current version of the housing element is sent to the state. Uh, be more aggressive, uh, number one, be more aggressive in identifying opportunity sites along San Pablo um, Avenue. It is honestly an embarrassment to the city and glaring evidence of inequity that 1600 Solano Avenue is not identified as an opportunity site in the housing element, even after its owners submitted plans to turn the underutilized the parcel into a multi-story mixed-use development. <coughs> Update zoning for Solano Avenue to allow for denser mixed-use developments. Submit a ballot measure to update Measure K so that dense development is possible uh, in the 11-acre empty par uh, un um, undeveloped parcel on S uh, Albany Hill on Pierce Street. Update zoning in R1 to eliminate planning review of window location, second story addition, sight lines, off street parking spaces, and to allow via local zoning up to four units to be built on a parcel. Uh, and also develops, uh, investigate the development of City Hall Triangle as a low income, mixed use public uh, project with public services on the first floor housing above. Um, I know some of these things are or sort of mentioned in passing in the housing element and somewhat stronger wording. Thank you for wording. your comment. And thank you. Hey, good evening again, uh, City Council members. Um, it's been a long night. This is uh, Derek Barnes again from East Bay Rental Housing Association. And I just wanted to leave everyone with some encouraging encouragement, um, some food for thought as you continue to move through this process of realizing the components in the housing element. I think the first point is um, as you progress, your thinking, your thoughts, your ideas, it may be a good idea to have or conduct impact studies and analysis, especially on the big pieces, the big programs that um, will undoubtedly come your way and you'll need to discuss. And it's critically important to take the time to do that. And we've seen this help uh, cities and the, for the cities that have elected not to go through this, pro this process um, ends up, you know, uh, leading to unintended consequences that I spoke about earlier this evening. So that's the first thing. The second thing too is uh, around education and resources. A few of the comments made earlier really kind of hone in on this area. There's a lack of education on, you know, from a housing provider perspective, um, as well as a renter perspective. Um, and that's because a lot of what we are dealing with is super, super complicated. You know, the more restriction, the more regulation, the more complexity, and that has to be dealt with. And, you know, Ever is here to be a partner with you and, um, and you know, discovering opportunities for education, educating both the renter and, uh, and the property owner. I think number three may be, um, a little provocative, but it's just something that I kind of thought about as I was listening to all the comments this evening, um, especially as we sort of protect um, what is probably the most um, 
scarce uh, piece of our, our, our housing, which is, you know, speaks to affordability. And, you know, the reality is that a lot of the affordable housing has already been created. It's already there. And so it'd be very difficult to, re, you know, to produce affordable housing without some of the, uh, the, the, the efforts of private, uh, private entities. So um, I would suggest maybe looking at ways or programs that you protect um, that part by, you know, introducing needs testing or means testing um, would be a good tool to protect um, that portion of housing, which is, you know, so scarce and does represent um, more of the affordability. Um, I think that's it. And just to remember that, you know, it is complicated. Housing is complicated. There is no one size fits all. So a lot of things have to be nuanced and really drive details in order to figure some of this stuff out. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you for your comment. That's, that's it. Okay, um, a couple questions that we can answer um, from that. Um, uh, again, I think I can answer the one about Arena last cycle, but this will be a fun <coughs> test. Um, uh, we, uh, I don't believe, met our goal in the fifth cycle. Um, we produced a little over 200 units. Um, I'm not getting nods on that one. Want the exact numbers? Yeah, please. <laughs> So the Reno was 335 in the last cycle, and the city produced 286 units, uh, but 175 of those were the Belmont Village assisted living units, and 70 were accessory dwelling units. So not a lot of market rate multifamily or affordable multifamily. And, and that was going to be my next point of um, that the percentages we produced those units in did not match our arena of what we were required to build in lower income. Um, they were largely uh, above moderate rate units. Um, part of that comment also said is the step by the state, sort of set by the state, but then the Association of Bay Area Governments actually gives us our number as they are the uh, enforcing entity for the entire nine county Bay Area. So that's where we actually get our arena number after the state has given us it for the entire region. Um, uh, we had a question of, uh, does it affirmatively further fair housing to put a lot of housing units on San Pablo? Um, can one of you speak to that of, because there is affirmatively furthering fair housing a requirement to not concentrate them all in one area? I believe we have done our due diligence there, but I wanted to make sure we answered that directly. Yeah, it's a little over half of the capacity is on the San Pablo corridor and the other half is spread out throughout the city on Solano Avenue and Albany Hill and in the um, single family neighborhoods through ADUs and uh, other lots that are harder to quantify. So we have made an effort to, um, to, to distribute the units around the city and San Pablo Avenue itself is a linear corridor so it, it isn't clustered in one single part of the corridor. Thank you. I, I will also note that I believe our housing element also goes into some depth of saying that all of Albany is a high resource area compared to everywhere else. So putting units here firmly furthers fair housing to a great extent rather than putting them in a lot of other places. Um, if I may add to the, the comment about the project 1600 Solano Avenue and why that wasn't in the housing element. HCD gives us criteria about the type sizes of project of parcels that can be identified as housing opportunity sites, and that site is too small to doesn't is is too small to meet the HCD criteria. Thank you. I I was going to get to that next. Um, so thank you for getting to it. But I was also going to add that uh, you know HCD has, is very tough on this cycle on our site analysis uh, and on the realisticness of developing a site. And as we discussed a little bit earlier, it is. Uh, not super realistic to assume that a lot of single family homes are going to be torn down and replaced with something uh, in a multifamily unit. The economics just don't really work with what houses sell for. So HCD might not have even given us credit for that even though it is happening. Um, uh, are we going to evaluate, uh, conduct impact studies to evaluate uh, any of the programs we're developing? It's okay if we don't have an answer for this because we're n not there yet. Absolutely. As we bring programs to you, we will do an ana objective analysis of best practices, what other cities are doing, 
Um, and if that involves bringing in consultants who have the technical expertise, we'll do that. It's no different than if we're designing a, a bike way or a storm drain or something, we hire somebody who has experience in designing those things so that we, we do it right. Excellent, thank you. Um, I believe that's all the uh, questions uh, that I noted down from public comment. Um, that brings us to council deliberation. Um, does anyone have any comments they'd like to start us off with? Um, I'll just start off by saying, you know, I really want to say thank you to everyone who's been involved in this thus far. You know, I know a lot of work and a lot of efforts gone through this. I, you know, understand there's lots of cities out there that, you know, are way far, further behind than, than we are in doing this. And um, I think that there's been a lot of careful consideration um, to this uh, plan and um, I just appreciate all the time. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think I would uh, second what Councilmember Hanson Romero said. I mean, the when I opened the housing element, uh, I was questions came to my mind, but the questions had little to do with basis by which we got to our housing element, nor the policies and direction that the housing element put in place. But more the questions came of really getting me excited about the opportunities we have now going forward, understanding the policies, the ideas that have been put in place that we as a council can help direct and put in place within our community. Um, the firm that I work for, we, we hear about a lot of the RENA numbers happening around the Bay Area. And I was very nervous about understanding how Albany was going to address the RENA numbers because every community is experiencing a huge increase in the RENA numbers. Uh, and so I was extremely enthusiastic to not only see what the housing element discussed about potential sites, the fact that we passed the San Pablo Avenue specific plan, but that it clearly lays out a roadmap for us as a council and our committees and commissions to take on over the next four years to really make Albany a place that welcomes new residents, that helps keep existing residents here, that helps our residents in the UC Village find some place to stay within this community when their time at UC ends. <clears throat> and so, um, Again, hats off to both staff, to Barry, to all those who have council members who were here from the get from the start of this process, and the committees. Because um, again, as I read through it, uh, I just I found lots of really helpful information that I think it will. It will um, I've already asked staff for some clarifications on some of the information provided within the general plan, uh, so the housing element. Um, but I'm really excited about the programs that we'll have in front of us over the next few years. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that because, again, I'm, I am excited about the housing element. Well, I'm going to make a motion when the time comes. <laughs> I just want to also extend my thanks to city staff uh, and um, consultants. Um, but also our respective uh, commissioners who have been part of the process as well, uh, that really, you know, working in conjunction with city staff and uh, past and current council to help unpack a lot of the language and the jargon. Um, but I just also want to give a huge shout out to the community for the level of engagement. Um, you know, whether, what, whatever side of, uh, the aisle anyone was at on any particular topic in, within the housing element, just knowing that folks knew or aware of the process, how to be de democratically involved and to know how to get council to hear them out. Um, I think that's a dope thing about uh, local governance and I hope to see more of that. I hope we could see uh, that same energy for other things that come up in future agenda item. But uh, that, you know, similar to what John was expressing, um, that leaves me very inspired because I know that the community members are here to put us to task, and I think we're all here for it. Um, 
And I look forward to working with uh, city staff, uh, wherever, whatever direction this housing element goes. Um, I will echo all of those comments. Um, you know, like the vice mayor, I'm a policy wonk, so this housing element really excites me. Um, and it, you know, it is my it is my day job to literally look at other housing elements. Um, so that's impressive in itself. Um, uh, to, to actually be excited about one. Um, and uh, as, I've, as I've said before, um, you know, the point of this process is to create a realistic, actionable plan that if worked through will have a meaningful, positive impact on housing production and the ability of our residents to live here. And not all localities actually commit to that idea, um, but I think we have done so with great sincerity and a big sense of purpose and created a plan that I think is really actionable and will do that, um, not only fulfill our requirements to the state, but actually create some, uh, go above and beyond and create some um, very good programs that will help housing in Albany. Um, to call one or two of those out, um, I, I just want to voice appreciation uh, for our team for uh, the one of the findings we're going to make is about non-vacant sites. Uh, you know, Berkeley got dinged on this recently, and that's why their most recent draft of their housing element did not pass. Um, but when I uh, worried, emailed uh, Jeff, he already had addressed this um, and talked to our HCD rep about it. Um, so it was not a big worry. Um, so we have responded to things that other people are getting their housing elements rejected for. Um, there's just too many small changes that I think are really very good in here to list, but they will all streamline development, there will be less meetings, there will be less difficulties and less costs for producing housing. Um, and I think that is really very good and very important to acknowledge that, you know, this has been a much easier process and a much more productive one than I think it could have been. Um, and uh, I very much appreciate that. Um, with that, I think we're ready for a motion. Uh, with that, we need a motion to extend. So much for my <laughs> prognostication. I, I, was, I was just about I knew to it say. was overly optimistic. <laughs> yeah. So somebody else has to try. Motion to extend to eleven ten. Seconded. Uh, to include what? Oh, 10-1. Ten one. <laughs> to include ten one. Great. Thank yes. you. Thank you. <laughs> Mayor Tiedemann. Yes. Councilmember Hanson Romero? Yes. Councilmember Jordan? Yes. Councilmember Lopez? Yes. And Vice Mayor Mickey? Yes. The motion carries. Now, with that done, I believe we are ready for a motion on our housing element. I will move uh, resolution 2023 09 with the direction on tenant protections that was moved earlier. I will second. There has been a motion and a second. Can we please have the roll? Council Member Lopez? Yes. Vice Mayor Mickey? Yes. Mayor Tiedemann? Yes. Council Member Hanson Romero? Yes. And Council Member Jordan? Yes. Motion carries. Ooh, thank you all. Um, that's a big milestone. Thank you very much to our team. Uh, we really appreciate all your work on this um, and for sticking with us late into the evening. Um, that brings us to item 10-1, uh, which is our council ad hoc committee report uh, regarding the Social and Economic Justice Commission. Can we please have that report? Before Rob. <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, council member Hanson Romero and I had uh, met uh, in the weeks prior to uh, discuss the future of the SEJC, and I will just express this wasn't uh, an easy discussion for us to have uh, because we do understand the ramifications and consequences of any change to any commission, mm. specifically this one. Um, but we also recognize that there's been, you know, recent difficulties with the SEJC, and so we felt uh, that. The idea of uh, sunsetting and uh, the SEJC and having a rebranding of sorts for a new commission, uh, racial inclusivity and social equity commission, gives it a nice new spunky uh, acronym name, RISE. Um, I think that's something that could really jive really well with 
folks too, um, to be like, oh, I'm a, I'm a rise commissioner. Um, but also uh, in having these conversations with city staff, you know, I had uh, pointed out that this could also uh, give Albany a bit more search engine visibility when people are looking up keywords. Um, and uh, SCJC can sometimes look like a mouthful, but if you see rise, that can get someone's attention. Like, oh, Albany rises, what, what's rising? Um, but that's what's on the uh, on the plant on the table right now um, is to uh, have us all vote to uh, move forward with the approval of this creation of the Rise Commission, um, with the caveat that we uh, have uh, city staff help uh, bring this out and also uh, have an updated chart that properly reflects. Uh, what is necessary. Um, and the last thing I will say is uh, part of this as well um, was to also have a bit more, uh, um, I, wouldn't, I don't want to say narrow focus, but more intentional focus on the work plan item. Uh, it was clear that <clears throat> the item, and you know, this is also me speaking as a previous SEJC member, the items are near and dear to a lot of us. Uh, that were on the previous work plan, and they warranted valid attention. Um, but it can sometimes also be, feel very mentally and emotionally exhausting, uh, taking on a litany of issues that are uh, uh, sometimes feel like they're wrongs within our community. And so the idea is, as we move forward with this, we also uh, ensure that council uh, has a reduced work plan load for this new commission so that they can focus on necessary work and as that gets through, we can update as needed for uh, other items to be worked on. And we were trying to narrow the focus to just two specific mm -hmm. uh, items so that they could concentrate on, on that and upon the successful completion of those things, we can move forward. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions from council? Um, so to clarify, this would be directing the work to, estab to establishing, if, if we should approve this, to establishing the RISE, RISE Commission, since we don't have the charge in front of us. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you for your work on this. And, and thank you, Robin, for the Councilperson Lopez for the um, the great uh, acronym. So I really I was very encouraged to because it sounded it was it's much more of a positive energy behind it. So. Yeah, the thought to branding an SEO and it is impressive <laughs> to say the least. You need something that really hits well with some of these younger <laughs> folks on social media. I'm trying to get some more new new younger recruits on on these commission. <laughs> I was out politicking over this weekend for someone potentially on the art commission. So, um, I mean, for me, that, that's a big thing is we also need to be cognizant of uh, time change and sometimes it's necessary to change branding and, you know, it's uncomfortable that it may feel, but also um, this, this is applicable to almost everything we work with. Policies need to change consistently to keep up with the time. Um, Housing element was a very <laughs> strong example. Um, but no, thank you, Jen. Thank you so much for uh, tag teaming on this. I, again, I know it's not easy taking on uh, a huge task like that, uh, knowing that uh, there are a lot of folks who are still married to the idea of the SEJC, and then there are also a lot of folks who uh, wanted, want to see it gets sunsetted because they didn't feel like it was productive. And I feel like this was a solid compromise mm -hmm. to keep something there um, and keep things moving forward. Just going to ask a procedural question before I... Um, were we supposed to take public comment before we started discussion? We're technically in where I like to have question time. Um, okay. The lateness of the hour has made us okay. less observant, but we will take a public comment. Right. Once so, you ask your question. Sure, sorry. Uh, so my uh, one question was, uh, did you two discuss at all um, size of the commission, or is that something that we would make as part of the work plan? 
when we discussed it, I think we had said that uh, we were okay with keeping it the same size. Uh, it, the bigger issue was that the work plan items were just overstretching people, mm -hmm. and it, that could cause people to not want to be on a commission if they feel like they're being overworked, mm -hmm. uh, especially when folks aren't being compensated with anything but community love, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, we will now go to public comment. I guess I'm going to be like Jeremiah and talk on every single item. <laughs> but, um, I just want to say the SEJC is near and dear to my heart. I was here the night in the council, council chambers when Alan Maris and Robert Lieber put it on the agenda and passed it. I was on it for 14 years saying that. I support the work you did and the rebranding of it, and I appreciate everything you put into this. And I'm so, I just have to apologize to everybody and this poor woman for my pacing. My back is killing me, and it only feels better if I'm moving. So that's I, I know it's probably distracting for you guys. Usually I do it at home, but I, I, I just have to apologize for that. I'm sorry. Worries, and thank you for sticking around in person, even if pacing was involved. <laughs> Guess who? It's Jeremiah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Marjorie. I'm not sure if that was a compliment or what. Um, not sure how to take that one, to be honest with you. It's kind of uh, interesting. Not sure why you said that, but um, I don't know. Not sure how to take that. Everybody kind of laughed at me. Um, I'm not sure how comfortable I feel about that comment there, Margie, about how Jeremiah makes a comment on every agenda item. <clears throat> so anyway, um, <clears throat> interesting. So basically, what's the mission statement uh, gonna be? Because right now, online at the city's website, the mission statement for the SEJC um, you know, there's a mission statement, right? I'm not going to sit here and read it, um, <clears throat> but so obviously now this is going to be who's who's responsible for creating a mission statement for this for this new commission. Um, I, I I feel you, Lopez. It's catchy, rise. I like it. I really do. It's um. It's kind of unique, and I I like the. The focus, um, but does that mean uh, this this new commission can't work on homelessness or unhoused <clears throat> individuals or um, you know food resources or housing or, or renters um, rights? Um, I'm not sure how how great it is to limit um, a commission and in. The city council gets to choose pre premeditated what the commission um, gets to put on their work plan. I don't know any other commission that the city council, I mean, tells the commission or committee what your work plan is before the committee or commission brainstorms and, and has an idea and, and talks about it. You know, there's no mission statement yet. Um, so, I mean, it, it's a good thing, but it kind of feels kind of uh, kind of like it's being controlled. And there's not much, um, you know, leeway on, on what the commission can work on. So I, I see, I foresee a problem with, you know, unhoused people, food resources, community programs, if it's just focusing on you know, certain things. Thank you for your comment. Yeah, hi, it's uh, Dave Danby here. Um, and first of all, I just wanted to thank everybody over the years uh, who were on SCJC, and especially Margie who's there. Uh, we've done a lot of excellent things for the, for the city, for our community. Um, 
And just to pick up on Jeremiah's uh, theme about uh, the work plan, I guess I'm curious about how that played into this decision to change the name and maybe the direction of, of, the, uh, of the commission. And uh, just a question, um, two items were mentioned that uh, uh, the, the commission was gonna focus on. Could you just tell me what those are? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. That's it. Um, we had a couple questions in there that I'm gonna to refer to the authors of this memo. Yeah, I could uh, try and get those in concisely before our uh, next several minutes. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, Jeremiah uh, raised a good point on uh, uh, other topics. Um, and I'd like to say this concept of social equity is intended, or that phrase is intended to encompass that. Um, also, uh, the phrase racial inclusivity pushes a couple mm. steps further uh, than what the SEJC uh, used to explicitly call out. Uh, we all are much aware SEJC, SEJC social economic justice. Um, there was never the, uh, anything around race specifically mentioned. And I know Council Member, uh, uh, Council Member Jordan, Mayor Teterman, this was uh, something that they wanted to bring to light and bring to issue, and this is why we're here now. Um, and I think them bringing that call to action uh, made, us, made me and Jen really think about ways that uh, we can get creative with maintaining something. Um, in terms of work plan uh, concerns, um, on the agenda, uh, and I made sure language was very careful, um, that we recommend a reduction in anticipated work plan items relative to the previous SEJC work plan. So, meaning we would still work with, within the scope of what SEJC had. Do you see how hard it is to say that? <laughs> um, and take a couple uh, big ticket items there and g give that to the new rise commissioners to work on. I hope that clarifies uh, questions that uh, public commenters had. I think so. Um, and I'll just say thank you both for doing the work. Um, you know, this fell to Councilmember Jordan and I last time, I think basically because we were the only people left on council. Um, and you guys have proven that you were obviously better at it than us. So we appreciate you, you know, this took some effort um, and uh, some different councils, but we, I think we've got to a place where we've got a very good suggestion in front of us um, with great branding. Um, with that, unless there's any other commentary, I think we're ready to take a motion. I make a motion to approve. I second. There's a motion and a second. Can you please call the roll? Council Member Jordan? Yes. Council Member Lopez? Yes. Vice Mayor Mickey? Yes. Mayor Tiedemann? Yes. Council Member Hanson Romero? Yes. The motion carries. Excellent. Um, due to the lateness of the hour, um, I think we will cover uh, our council subcommittee reports um, in the next meeting, um, uh, which brings us to future agenda items. Um, we did have one uh, request from the public earlier that I'd like us to keep alive if there's anything we can do to support the people dealing with the issues at the um, uh, daycare. Um, I know we don't have legal recourse through our lease with them, but if there's a letter we can send or support, that would be useful. Um, I wanted to make sure we mentioned that. Are there any others from the council? Yes, I would uh, like to propose a future agenda item for uh, council to consider writing a letter of support for uh, staff in the UC Village that are looking to uh, explore the idea of renaming one of the parks as Bobby Se after Bobby Seal, one of the co-founders of the Black Panthers, who happened to go to school over there in Cordonese's Village, uh, what UC Village was previously named. Um, a lot of interesting local history. I for, uh, I'm completely blanking on the community member that brought this attention and information to UC Village staff, but I applaud them for bringing that up, and I would love to see this on the table for uh, City of Albany to really support something uh, 
potentially quite major. Excellent, thank you. Any others from the council? Um, Cal Cities has sent us a, a, a model resolution regarding an um, initiative, state initiative they qualified that would make it much more difficult for local jurisdictions to pass taxes as well as require them to put fees, many, most, maybe all fees on the ballot, which they don't currently have to. So I'll bring that to the next, uh, to the next meeting. Thank you. Uh, are there any members of the public who'd like to comment on this item? Uh, yeah, um, I was gonna, when you mentioned the park renaming, I was gonna, I, I know I mentioned in the past about renaming Memorial Park to Ohlone Park or Albany Hill to Ohlone Hill. Um, that'd be a nice a future agenda item. Also, uh, I'm not sure if anybody knows uh, what Solano means. I'm pretty sure Solano is a, a Native American chief, um, Chief Solano. I'm not sure, but maybe, um, we can look into that. And also, last but not least, future agenda item, uh, some sort of resolution to where um, uh, public commenters don't uh, make other public commenters feel uncomfortable by making a public comment. Really appreciate that. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you for your comment. Um, that brings us to adjournment. Um, after people govern themselves to our announcements of city meetings and events. Um, thank you to the rest of the council, vice mayor, clerk, uh, city staff, um, anyone who stuck around with us late into the evening, much appreciated, uh, and we are adjourned.